So welcome everyone to the Global Women's Assembly for Climate Justice, Solutions from the Front Lines and the Protection and Defense of Human Rights and Nature. This is an inclusive space across identities and the gender spectrum. My name is Osprey Oreo Lake, and I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or WECAN. And I'm really honored to be here in Coast Miwok lands in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, where I am a guest on their territories. As we open this gathering, please be welcome to introduce yourself in the chat with your name and where you're from. And already, uh, we've been just so excited to have people from all over the world joining us from Senegal, from Bolivia, Iceland, Nigeria, Japan, Indonesia. It's just been really exciting. And I have heard about this one amazing group that is meeting in the DR Congo around one um, iPhone and, and creating a watch party together. So uh, we've just been really thrilled with, with the, the global outreach and communication and support. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and before we start, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge um, this very challenging time for many people and welcome all of you to a space for us to be together from around the world. Please know that we can is here for you and that you're not alone and we send you our love and well-being. As part of this assembly, we recently released our call to action to governments and financial institutions worldwide during the time of the UN General Assembly, which is the last time governments are meeting before the important climate talks in Glasgow. It's a really powerful call to action that 120 organizations have signed, representing millions of people worldwide. And we're putting that link into the chat now because we're opening up the signatures again for organizations and individuals um, because we will be taking this call to action with us to COP26 in November in Glasgow. And uh, also just to mention right now, the pre-COP uh, is in session and we're monitoring um, that very closely over these next days. Um, I'm really excited about this upcoming panel. Um, we are, um, excuse me, I'm getting a message. Um, we're really excited about this upcoming panel. Um, we are presenting today, uh, Media Visibility of Women's Climate Leadership. Um, and we wanna thank all of you who are working in the media for your really critical work. It's so vital to shift the narrative and public discourse to challenge dominant systems of exploitation and oppression of women, particularly BIPOC women and the earth, and break open more media spaces to spotlight how women, feminist and gender diverse leaders are leading struggles and solutions for climate justice. We will not be able to usher in the healthy and just future we seek without feminist solutions and centering the voices of women on the front lines of the crisis, who are also on the front line of solutions. So the media can play such a central role in pushing forward this agenda, which is why I really wanted to include um, this particular panel in this overall assembly. Um, I'm really honored to introduce Marquia Thomas, who is a press consultant and on our media team for the Global Assembly. Assembly, And I wanted her to join me to moderate this important conversation. And with that, the floor is yours, Marquia. And thank you for introducing the panelists and for moderating. And thank you again to the panelists for joining us. Marquia. Hi, everyone. My name is Marquia Thomas. Uh, just to give everyone a brief introduction for myself, uh, former journalist, used to be a news anchor, uh, currently working in the communication space for climate and environmental justice. And I'm super happy to be here and to moderate this panel. So if we are ready, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, so women are impacted first and worst by climate change, yet are simultaneously essential actors in local and global solutions. Studies worldwide demonstrate that women must be engaged at all levels of participation, leadership, and decision-making to build effective and just social and ecological programs and communities. And yet the voice and rights of women often continue to be suppressed and ignored. As CNN and Media Matters have reported, only about 16%, 15% of those, excuse me, interviewed by the media on climate change have been women. 
And connecting the dots between women and gender diverse leaders and the climate crisis is important, not only because of the extreme impacts felt by women, but also because of the unique insights and important solutions that women bring to the table, yet they are continually underrepresented in media. And how can we assure coverage of women's leadership and climate stories? And so I'm super happy to have all of our speakers here. Um, we have some amazing people here to talk um, and talk about women and climate and media and climate. So first we are kicking things off with Amy Goodman, host and executive producer of Democracy Now. Hi, Amy. Hi, Marquia. Although I was asking not to change things up right from the beginning, is there any chance I could not go first having just raced from Democracy Now? I'd love to hear someone speak first. Absolutely. We could just go to the next speaker, no problem. Yeah, so next we have um, Andrea Hernandez, filmmaker and journalist from Guatemala. I'm Marquia. Well, I'm Andrea Ischu Hernandez, uh, Maya Quiche from Guatemala. I'm very honored to be here. So yeah, I, I can totally start and it's good to be here. Great, so if you wanna just kick it off, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start. Well, first of all, I, I want to say that I'm very happy and honored to participate in this panel and this, in this assembly among amazing women who sow futures and hopes. I would like to start by honoring the memory of all those who have been sued on the earth. Our sisters and brothers murdered defending our lands, forests, water, and territories all over Latin America. I also want to start demanding freedom for our sisters and brothers who are political prisoners in Guatemala for putting their bodies at the service of life and have set limits to the colonial dispossession model from Canada to Argentina also. Our mother earth is sick, so are our peoples. These are times of pandemic and climate emergency, ecocide and genocide. Today, we live the consequences of an economic, social and spiritual model that has infected our territories and our bodies a virus that puts money above life. This model made us live in constant state of emergency. The dispossession of our territories, the plunder on the mother earth, the permanent ecocide and genocide crisis, the governments persecuting our diversity, the corporations financing our annihilation, the military and paramilitaries at wars against our communities. As the climate crisis progresses, the murders of earth defenders are on the rise. This fever, has been raging in our territories for more than 500 years ago. From a very young age, I have been working as a communicator and I have been able to experience the power of stories in my life. The stories we tell and we are told give meaning to the world we live in. And that's why I work from narratives and community communication to change the stories that reproduce colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism. I do communication to honor the struggles that so many people make for sustainable change and to build other worlds. I have learned that changing communication allows changing the narratives and that changing the narratives can change the thoughts and attitudes of the people. And this can cause more sustainable cultural change. That's why I do not participate in the doomsday narratives of the climate crisis that paralyze and kill hope. And every time I am looking in every story for seeds of the future. I come from an indigenous community from the Maya Quiche people in Guatemala. And when we say that we are Quiche, we are the forest, name itself. And that is why in that way of living, feeling, understanding and existing of many indigenous communities that I learned to understand that the earth and nature are our condition of existence. We call our environmentalism, the defense of life and territory. We name it community management of water and energy land autonomy, indigenous governments, rescue of linguistic diversity, recovering our identity, seeking memory and justice, migrating without borders, growing crops, returning to cyclical timing, honoring grandmothers and grandfathers knowledge, defending the future of the generations to come, practicing other ways of spirituality, organizing community festivities. During the research processes that I have done, uh, I, I've been doing narrative and media analysis I have listened to the climate crisis conversation while I'm also documenting the land defense processes in many indigenous communities that are being carried out in recent years in Guatemala and in other parts of Latin America. 
from that processes, I have learned a few things. Indigenous peoples who defend the territory safeguard the 80% of remaining biodiversity in the planet, and they should be considering living alternatives to the climate crisis. The climate crisis is a matter of a structural inequality. The crisis has been indig in indigenous territories for more than 500 years, and it is also called ecocide and genocide. It's annihilating human and natural diversity on our planet. The leaders and governments have made it very clear they are not willing to change the pattern of this possession. And what indigenous peoples are saying is that it is time to change and that the change is to come from below. And that happens mainly through women and the communities that are already generating processes of healing the earth. The speeches of the green economy are just blah, 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 just like Greta said. And the emergency forces are forcing us to take action from below. And this is an issue of environmental and social justice. There cannot be environmental movement that is capitalist, colonial, racist, or, or patriarchal, because those are the foundation of this crisis. So that it's why capitalist, colonial, racist, or patriarchal journalism is also promoting this civil civilizational and environmental crisis. From indigenous spaces, we are making a call to reimagine many of the harmful practices of journalism and stories that depend on capital. It's time that our narratives break the limits imposed on us by the capital and the limits of imagination of governments. It's urgent to decolonize the climate crisis narrative. We do not save the earth. We need to take responsibility, stop consuming the territories. We need to defend the defenders and be part of the cure of the earth. What makes us believe that the states, the governments, the companies that are created to sustain capitalism, colonialism, racism, patriarchy are willing to change their foundations? Taking responsibility implies for the global north something more urgent than 50 years of transition. We need immediate transformation. What does that mean for those who are doing journalism and those who are telling stories? How can we repair from non-capitalist, non-colonial, non-racist and patriarchal practices from the narratives? The transformation requires an exercise of political imagina imagination that goes beyond governments, beyond public policy, beyond reforming and greening capitalism. The future requires imagining beyond green energy because we indigenous peoples can tell you how it is to live with wind turbines everywhere. And if you wonder how to start, it is only necessary to look at the peoples that for 500 years have kept 80% of the remaining biodiversity alive. There are many answers, more answers from an ancestral futures. What some imagine as utopia already exists in many indigenous communities. The alternatives to the climate crisis are already here, but they are being massacred. But our hope is still alive. We are still alive. And the solidarity from the, from the environmental movements warm, warm my heart. And that's why I want to invite you to follow the work that is coming from different indigenous women all over the world. I want you to invite you to follow the work and the collective work that I do with many indigenous women in platforms that we call Cura da Terra and Indigenous y Futuros Indígenas. We just released a series of three documentaries named Cure of the Earth that features indigenous women in Guatemala that help us to answer the question, how do we heal our bodies, our spirits, and our territories in times of climate crisis? Cura da Terra, or Cure of the Earth, is also a global gathering of indigenous women that we started last year during pandemic. And we named it after we listened to our sisters and different biomes of like Amazonia, Cerrado, Pantanal in Brazil. We have listened to our sisters from other territories, to their, to their head in times of pandemic and destructive fires. We respond with this calling by honoring the areas of action on the reflection of their struggle. In a context where the capital continues to expand, where extractivism, land grabs, and violent and forces displacement, the effects of the climate emergency and structural violence destroy the way of life, how do we heal our territories? When our bodies, our mothers and grandmothers have been plundered by war, when systemic racism grows, showing us ugliest face, how do we heal our bodies? When the monoculture of progress and development colonizes our aspiration, when religious fundamentalism is a plague in our communities, 
eroding the knowledge of our ancestors, how do we heal our spirits? So we are organizing this gathering to bring us together to intertwine pathways in the struggle to stop the climate and civilizational crisis. This indigenous women gathering will happen again. And this year will be in, held in October 23, will be a global gathering of indigenous women. We want to listen indigenous voices. Indigenous women know the importance of healing our bodies and territories individually and collectively. We are the ones that sow corn and rebellion. We raise our voices on languages and defend the forests, lakes, mountains, midwalls, deserts. We are the ones that make decisions about our bodies and reproduce life. We are the ones who tell the stories by the firesides and transform the narratives. We are the ones who defend the community and habitate the cities. Our very existence is resistance. We are the ones who dream and build a world where all the leaves belong. So yesterday, you screened a video called A Message from the Future. And that made me think that this utopian world already exists in many indigenous communities. So if you want to take a trip to the future, maybe you only need to take and walk around your own community. So I want to share to finish my presentation a video that we prepared for this very special occasion. Catherine, can you help her screen share? Andrea, do you have it? I think all the panelists have the ability. Oh, there, there we go. go. Thank you. Andrea, how's it going over there? I think it's working. Traemos un mensaje desde un futuro más esperanzador. Uno en el que logramos detener la catástrofe climática y civilizatoria. La solución no fueron los viajes espaciales y la colonización de otros planetas. No fueron las grandes negociaciones entre los poderosos, sino la organización de abajo, los que estamos cerquita de la Tierra. No fue fácil, pero fue posible. 2021 fue el año en que asumimos la urgencia de dejar de financiar el exterminio con consumismo y empezamos a curarnos con la Tierra. En 2021 nos quedó claro que el futuro no se negocia, el futuro se defiende. En 2021 nos dimos cuenta que las alternativas a la crisis climática siempre estuvieron aquí, viviendo en los pueblos que cuidan la vida. En 2021 reconocimos la ciencia de los saberes ancestrales que nos han permitido vivir en reciprocidad con los territorios por miles de años. En 2021 asumimos la responsabilidad de entender que la naturaleza es nuestra condición de existencia y que la lucha por la madre tierra es la madre de todas las luchas. En noviembre de 2021, una delegación indígena de defensores de la tierra asistiremos a la COP26 en Reino Unido para sembrar otras narrativas sobre el cambio climático. En tiempos de pandemia, ecocidio y genocidio, es urgente reconocer a los pueblos indígenas que defienden el 80% de la biodiversidad restante en el planeta como alternativas vivas a la crisis climática. Te invitamos a ser parte de este viaje desde el futuro. So, I wanted to end uh, by saying that it's really important to put in the center of the climate crisis conversation the voices of indigenous women, the voices of indigenous communities. And I want, want also to invite you to follow the next adventure that we're heading, I will be traveling and documenting a delegation of 14 indigenous amazing leaders 
that are traveling from Mexico and Guatemala to put another narratives, to seed another narratives from the, for the climate crisis at the COP. Because we know that the changes comes from below and that we need to do local action, but connect it to global, to global mobilization for Mother Earth. So thank you for this space. I was very honored. Thank you. Um, next, we have Antonia Yuhas, author, investigative journalist, analyst from the U.S. Thank you, Markea. Um, wow, such an honor to follow my friend and sister and heroine, Andrea. Um, I'm not sure what much else needs to be said, but I guess I'll try and add something to the discussion because that was um, just incredible. And let me just mark my time really quickly so that I can make sure I stay to the, to the time. Um, so um, it is an honor to be on this panel uh, with everyone and to join you all on this last day. Um, and I just wanna start with the good news um, because as I think Andrea made really clear uh, in her presentation, there is a lot of good news. And one of that is that there is no shortage of incredible stories to report and tell about women, particularly indigenous and women of color, leading efforts to confront the climate crisis and fossil fuels. Um, my colleagues on this panel and I have made careers out of reporting these stories, including for the world's largest outlets, including Democracy Now!, including CNN, um, and also probably like my colleagues, um, I'm in the midst of writing a news story right now, and I'll return to it after the panel, about a woman of color leading such efforts in her community in Louisiana. I report these stories regularly for Rolling Stone, for outlets like Newsweek, CNN, Harper's Magazine, Sierra Magazine, Ms., and others. There's been a shift in the media in the last five years, I'd say, and it's increasing, with much more interest in an ability to report climate stories and document the stories of women's leadership and women of color leading climate justice organizing and from frontline communities. Among the more obvious reasons for this shift is a great deal more awareness of the climate crisis as it worsens and people's firsthand knowledge makes them not only aware but willing to act in order to bring about change that will stem the climate tide. And it's also the result, of course, of incredible organizing and the movements we just saw in Andrea's presentation, working to help or make us connect the dots between actors and forces, such as fossil fuels and the fossil fuel industry and outcomes, namely devastating weather patterns and action that can affect both. This organizing on the climate has coincided with the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, indigenous and feminist and peace movements, which have forced a reckoning within many national and international institutions, including the media. But I believe there's been some particular moments of change and I actually wanna call out two. And one is Standing Rock. I think it was a turning point for a number of journalists who covered it and experienced firsthand indigenous women's frontline leadership. And importantly, the tie between fossil fuels, fossil fuel companies and the climate crisis, which many had not previously understood. And Standing Rock also of course brought uh, just an incredible plethora of coverage, um, both national and international. I think another turning point was the Paris Climate Accords. And that was uh, as a result of incredibly hard work of feminist, anti-racist, anti-colonial, indigenous, frontline organizing and other groups, not just bringing attention to women and women of color and the climate crisis um, through the media covering that organizing and the negotiations themselves, but importantly, the uh, activities also taking place outside on the streets in protests, the plethora of organizing that occurred across Paris, but also around the world. I think this really opened the eyes of individual journalists and outlets, not only even more so to the climate crisis than many had been before, but to women and women of color leadership uh, within these movements. I think Glasgow has the potential to do this again, to be another turning point moment. So audiences have been demanding stories that highlight the role of women and women of color tackling the climate crisis and seeking climate justice. There's also been a lot more money to cover climate stories. And that's really important in the coverage. It means that there has been more jobs to do this coverage, uh, coverage that is targeted on the climate. 
it means that there has been more ability to do this reporting. I'm stressing that because um, as Andrea told us, we're in a media operating in a capitalist system right now that we're trying hard to push against. But that money that's funding, and this is one of the reasons to push against it, as Andrea stressed, that money could easily disappear, right? This could be a fad of the moment. It could be a climate fad, a climate fad of funding. And when it, uh, yeah, and when it goes away, uh, that coverage could disappear with it if we are tied to that to those funding streams. And that is particularly a problem because that money right now, while a lot of it is targeted climate reporting, it has not necessarily been targeted at supporting coverage or reporting by women and women of color. There are bright spots, of course. We have Amy Goodman at Democracy Now!, we have Nicole Hannah-Jones at the New York and others who have forced changes in coverage that have meant women of color are starting to see coverage that matches the facts on the ground, which is their overweighted role in experiencing the greatest harms and vulnerability to the climate crisis racial injustices, sexism, classism, and their outsized, outsized role in leading resistance and recovery efforts to these ills. And as I said, there's been great, there's been bit great reporting, but of course there are problems. And those problems are that sexism, racism, classism still permeate the media. Uh, I had an editor who just recently told me uh, that I couldn't use the words environmental racism in an article because, quote, the audience doesn't understand it. I've had editors routinely edit out women of color uh, from my articles in favor of, and I quote, hard facts and real experts. So let's be clear, the media, while having an increasing number of women among, among its ranks, is still dominated by white men. The latest data from Columbia Journalism Review uh, finds that among the nation's leading newspapers in the United States, the 135 most widely distributed newspapers, excuse me, among editors, 73% are male and nine in 10 are white. Women uh, are increasingly com uh, comprising the people who work in newsrooms. So in the United States, about 42% of overall workers in newsrooms, those hired in newsrooms are women but just 22.6% of those uh, workers are people of color. And I wanna cite these statistics because I think they're really uh, telling about who the media turns to when it is identifying who it believes experts are. And that's one of the biggest problems that I think a lot of us confront in the necessity of coverage of women of color, indigenous women leading on the front lines of the climate crisis and fossil fuels is the understanding of our editors of what an expert is. And there still is this false uh, sense or expectation that experts are uh, exclusively scientists or people from the academy, um, people who have a status quo set of um, uh, credentials that the media still, that many in the media still insist are the standards of quote unquote expertise. And when you look at, and this was a great new study from the Women's Media Center that came out just this year, which looked at who are the guests on the five big Sunday TV news shows in the US. Of those guests, only 20% for, for the year of 2020, only 20% were women, sorry, excuse me, oh, shoot. 20% were white women, 2% were Latinx women, 9% were Black women, 0.6% were Asian American women, and half of those appearances were by one person. Only one woman of Middle Eastern North African descent appeared on the shows, and no Indigenous women were guests. All the rest were white men. And at that time went a lot faster than I had planned, so I'm going <laughs> to wrap up with one uh, negative story and then put it into a positive uh, ending in, in one minute. Um, the problem is not just the media. It's also, and that I've outlined, it's also gatekeepers. So there are gatekeepers in the media, in, gatekeepers in the academy, gatekeepers at NGOs, who when we go to try to do interviews for stories, won't let us interview women of color within those institutions. And we have to fight like hell to get to those women and tell those stories. 
And that's a message to all of the gatekeepers out there to make sure that the expertise that is there of women of color, of frontline women who are in the leadership positions, who are experiencing the crises of climate change and presenting the solutions, are the people who are presented to the media as those who should be being uh, interviewed, their stories should be told, they should be represented and given the time to do that. So this is another piece of that. Within the NGOs and the other gatekeepers needs to be the realization that women on the front lines also have, women of color on the front lines, also have many, many, many more hurdles they have to overcome to the time to be the subjects of those stories. So when I'm interviewing someone, it takes time for them, time out of a very busy life to sit for interviews, to respond to fact checking, to be available, to be the subject of that story. And the other people in their circle, in their lives need to appreciate that. And if they want those stories to be told, those women need to be supported in their ability to tell their own stories, to tell their own narratives, and to tell their stories and narratives to others. And that's a challenge for all of us to take on as we try to highlight the role, the problems that exist within the media, but also within our own, um, within families, within organizing groups, within NGOs, within other circles that we operate in, how to make sure that women are supported in every way as storytellers, as agents of the media, as people within the media, and as um, the subjects of stories themselves. So uh, because I've already taken a lot of time, I'm gonna end there. Thank you all again. Really excited to hear the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Antonia. That was great. Um, and you're totally right about gatekeepers at NGOs. Like it is such a serious thing um, and also challenging for comms people to work through as well. Um, so next we have Amy Goodman, host and executive producer of Democracy Now! here in the USA. I'll let you take it away, Amy. Oh, well, it's great to be with you. And I'm so honored to be part of this panel and this amazing series of days where you're talking about women-led climate movements around the world. Um, and to follow Andrea and Antonia um, and to be joined with Rachel as well to talk about the importance of media. And I think we have to add to this the importance of corporate free media. Because so often you have the networks that are often brought to you by the very corporations that are bringing us the problems. And it's not that they can't do a good job, but they are facing much more pressure from within um, to take on um, the powers that be and that power them. Uh, and, you know, Democracy Now! just today, uh, talking about Enbridge Line 3 and the battle royale that indigenous people are waging in northern Minnesota. Um, it just announcing that it's going to be moving ahead with um, oil flowing. I think it's tomorrow. Uh, we have been interviewing Tara Hauska, the indigenous lawyer and activist, um, recently arrested and arrested and arrested, um, uh, as well Winona LaDuke, uh, who's right up there at the White Earth Reservation, who has been fighting this. And I just so underscore what the other panelists have said about the importance of people framing their own story. And so often in environmental stories, we're talking about women-led movements and indigenous women-led movements. Um, going back to Standing Rock, we've just passed, we're in the fifth anniversary of uh, this historic gathering in 2016. You know, that was the time of the Trump versus Clinton presidential race. And the networks were, not only were they hardly covering Standing Rock and the standoff there, but um, when it came to the presidential debates that define what's important, what are the issues that people should be paying attention to, not one of the moderators in those debates, no matter what network, raised the issue of climate change. We're talking 2016, let alone what was happening at Standing Rock. Um, we were following it from afar. 
Um, and But then in Labor Day of that year, we raced to Standing Rock, the Labor Day weekend, uh, to bring out the voices of people on the ground. And it was there that we witnessed this atrocity. Already hundreds had been arrested. Um, you know, Standing Rock begun with LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, may she rest in power, uh, who is the unofficial historian of the Standing Rock um, uh, Reservation. Uh, she opened her property to those who would resist the Dakota Access Pipeline. She thought dozens would come, set up teepees, set up tents. Well, dozens, then hundreds, then thousands of people. You had the Sacred Stone Camp. You had um, the Red Warrior Camp and so many others uh, where people gathered to take on this powerful corporation um, uh, to challenge what was happening on their territory and adjacent to it. Um, they also were defining how to talk about them. They said, don't call us protesters, call us water protectors. Uh, and they were challenging that the Dakota Access Pipeline would be built, but also built into the Missouri River, the longest river in North America, that would imperil the water supply of 17 million people downstream. The weekend we went, we we're following different protests, and then we went to an area that the Standing Rock called their sacred ground. A judge was going to rule on it a few days later. They wanted to post their tribal uh, flags from different communities, First Nations in Canada, Latin America. The non-Native allies came to watch, and they saw bulldozers, one, two, three, four, five, six bulldozers, and they were already excavating what, what had been forbidden. And the fact is that Standing Rock historians had given over the map because a judge requested it of, to prove it was their sacred ground. He gave it to uh, Dakota Access Pipeline. And using this map, they brought their um, bulldozers in from afar and they were gonna make it a moot point what the judge would rule because they were excavating before. Young women, girls, women, men, boys, all stood in front of the bulldozers, risking their lives. We're talking about earth crushing machines. We were just filming the team of Democracy Now! And we came on the site, the bulldozers started to pull away because of this bravery. Um, and then the security guards started unleashing dogs. That's right, you know, like from the civil rights era, dogs and we filmed the dog with its nose and mouth dripping with blood and they were attacking the native americans and they, they were being maced they were being beaten they were being bloodied um finally the guards and the bulldozers pulled away not like uh shock shockingly it was the resistance that forced them back even though they had been hit so hard and people marched forward um we then posted this online and within 24 hours, there were like 14 million views. It showed that people all over the world, deeply concerned about the climate emergency, we were in and are continuing to be it. Um, we came back to New York, continued to cover this. And a few days later, a judge was gonna rule and they quietly announced that they were going to um, arrest me, arrest me as a journalist. I learned of this when I was in Canada. I raced back to the United States because I thought they wouldn't let me back into uh, the United States. And we knew we had to go right back because they were simply using democracy now to send a message, I thought, especially to young journalists, do not dare to go to North Dakota or this is what could happen to you. We raced back, they dropped the charges, then they brought more serious felony riot charges against me. We had to take this on, but we also wanted to cover the protests. We weren't the story, but because they were arresting journalists, the rest of the media came in. And as we stood broadcasting our show and I was going to turn myself in, it was too much for the local judges who had arrested so many hundreds of Native Americans. Um, it was the homepage of BBC and Al Jazeera, New York Times, even Vogue magazine. But what's interesting is when we can get the media to start focusing its spotlight on the issues that matter, the kind of reality TV where it's really reality. Um, it changes everything. The judge then didn't dare uh, move forward with the arraignment. And it was not only that he dropped the charges against me. 
really quick. We have like 30-ish seconds left. So if you could okay. just- The Native Americans that were facing uh, jail that day had their charges dropped. We need a media, a grassroots, global, independent, international investigative media around the globe that is giving voice to the grassroots because that is where the power is. A media that is a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around, discuss and debate the most important issues of the day, war and peace, uh, ecocide, uh, racism, LGBTQ issues, all of these issues, most importantly, inequality, especially in a time of a pandemic. And that's the kind of media that everyone's going to tune into, Democracy Now! Thank you, Amy, that was great. Uh, next, we have Karina Gonzalez, We Can Women Speak Programs Coordinator here in the USA. Karina, you're up next. Hey, what's up? Uh, thank you, Marquia. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Karina Gonzalez. I am a Purepecha woman indigenous to what is known today as Michoacan, Mexico, though I was born in the so-called San Fernando Valley. It's an honor, an absolute honor to be here with you today on the last day of Weekend's Global Assembly. For about three years now, I've had the great privilege of working with WeCan as the Women Speak Coordinator, and that's the, that's the project I'll be speaking to you about. Um, Women Speak is an online research and storytelling database designed to ta challenge dominant systems of exploitation and oppression of women and the earth. Through the collection of sharing hundreds and ultimately thousands of stories about women leading struggles and solutions for climate justice, under a variety of themes. We can decided to build and launch this database after many conversations with partners and after deep reflection on our years of collaborative move movement building and our work to uplift women's voices in all climate change discussions and solution building efforts. It was really clear to us that the majority of the world's political and business leaders, journalists, academics, funders, and unfortunately, even many climate justice organizations and advocates still didn't necessarily understand the realities in which many women are disproportionately impacted by environmental injustice and yet still work with fierce resolve um, for a more just and equitable world. So Women Speak comes from the determination to bring women's voices to the forefront in their full diversity, their full humanity and their, their full strength. We were also determined to move beyond statistics, which many others had been compiling and relying on for many years. So statistics are really useful, but we wanted to move beyond them and instead move towards qualitative evidence and storytelling, the individual stories, the moments, the snapshots of women, their work and their communities. So rather than just declaring that 80% of global climate refugees are women, or that 75% of household food production is done by women, we could instead provide hundreds of examples of how women have been affected and responded to climate disasters in different regions, or even show that hundreds of, or hundreds of different examples of women-led farming projects to building food security, seed sovereignty, and health. At any given moment, we have 10 incredible women across the world curating stories for this database. So if you have any stories, articles, podcasts, videos, radio interviews, anything linkable that you think is missing from this database or should be a part of the collection, please send them to us. We want to highlight and recognize deferring experiences of women when it comes to environmental injustice and highlight the stories that are not often told. Um, a few years ago, I was telling one of my older cousins about Women Speak, um, and much of my family, including this cousin, are farm workers in Mexico, and she was just feeling really sad, really disillusioned by the spread of monoculture and a homogenization of seeds that we've been seeing there for years now. Um, and on the Women Speak website, she came across this story about Palestinian women who had started a seed library. Um, if you don't know, a seed library aims to find and preserve seed varieties and traditional farming practices. Um, and she was so inspired by the story that she read um, that she decided to start a seed library herself. Um, and I was talking to her about this maybe a year or so after she started it. And she said to me, 
At first, I thought this was just about revitalizing agriculture, but it's so much more than that. This is also about preserving cultural history and identity with pride and a recognition of community power. And so she's been working on this seed library for two years now, and it continues to grow. This is like, this is the power of women speak, right? Like, yes, it's a storytelling database meant to demonstrate why women are central to climate justice, but also it provides inspiration and information and um, connections on just how women are contributing across the globe. This database holds vast knowledge and skill drawn through women's roles as healers, organizers, artists, cultural shapers and caretakers of the land. Um, so Women Speak allowed for a seed library in Palestine to inspire another one on the other side of the planet. And as the COVID crisis continues and we can't necessarily be in person together, we need more spaces and platforms like this that allow for a cross-contamination of ideas virtually. So places like Women Speak become increasingly more important. And so I would encourage everyone watching now to use and enjoy this tool and share its stories, but also I would encourage the storytellers on this panel to use this as a resource for your work. There are many women leaders here whose stories and work should continue to be highlighted beyond this collection. We just talked about giving voice to the grassroots. This is a great place to find these, these voices and, and these people. Um, thank you. And I can share the, the link in the chat. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, finally, we have uh, Rachel Ramirez, climate writer and journalist with CNN here in the USA. All right. Hi, everyone. Half a day and hello. Um, it's an honor to be joining all of you here at the Global Women's Assembly for Climate Justice. My name is Rachel Ramirez, and I am the climate writer at CNN. You know, CNN has never really had a climate team, um, just a weather team and a few reporters and writers interested in covering climate change. But this year, CNN finally invested in an entirely new team dedicated to climate change. And as of July, three months ago, we were in full force. Um, and it's an important time given that we had a summer filled with climate disasters. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about today is something that's probably new to many of you and an area where I told CNN I wanted to cover more of before I started the job. Um, and I said half a day in the beginning of my speech because it's the greeting of the native Tomorrow people in the Mariana Islands. Um, for background, I am not indigenous Chamorro, but I was born and raised in Saipan, Northern Mariana Islands, you know, taught and raised by the very native people there. Um, it's a U.S. territory just north of Guam. And so if you pull up a map, it's a tiny dot east of the Philippines in the Micronesia region. Um, but being from a tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, we're no strangers to climate disasters, especially tropical storms. Um, I grew up in a tiny apartment with my Filipino immigrant parents in the village of Chalancanoa, just three blocks away from the beach. And I remember having to evacuate to higher ground whenever typhoons or tsunamis would approach. Um, and I've experienced my share of typhoons, though it was no nothing as monstrous as Super Typhoon U2, which hit um, my homeland uh, back in 2018. Just a year before U2, Hurricane Maria made headlines when you know, it pummeled Puerto Rico, um, another US territory, but many mainland Americans didn't hear much about Super Typhoon U2 hitting the Northern Mariana Islands. And that's not only because of the scarce media attention, but also because the islands are just largely missing from US history textbooks. Um, and according to uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, Super Typhoon U2 actually made history as the worst storm to hit United States soil since 1935. And just to give you a comparison, Hurricane Maria's highest wind speed was 174 miles per hour, while Super Typhoon U2 sustained winds of 180 miles per hour, even maybe even more. Um, I didn't experience U2 since I was working here in New York then, but my parents and my little sister, who have since moved out of our hometown, did. And I remember not being able to reach them for hours, not seeing any updates from friends and other family members back home, until finally my parents sent me photos of our entire apartment flooded, the window shattered. Um, but other than that, we were luckier than most who actually lost their homes that day, and a lot of the damages were repairable. Um, but despite months of no power and no running water or people having to live in FEMA refugee-like tents for more than a year, the community really came together and helped each other 
recover. And I wrote about that, that sort of aftermath process a year later. And I want to say this because Pacific Islanders have been, have always been the most vulnerable victims of climate change and, you know, pollution from US military activities as they grapple with intensifying storms, coastal erosion, sea level rise, and other um, crises that threaten not only their traditions, but their very existence, you know, existence, despite having lived sustainable lives and not, you know, emitting large amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. And throughout all this, I do see women leading the way in these recovery um, processes from cooking food for those in shelter. I remember interviewing a female guidance counselor um, who had to explain to kids why they aren't going back to school, why they had to stay and at a shelter while their parents, you know, line up for two hours to fill up their, their car or get groceries and other necessities. Um, and a few months ago, I wrote a story about how Pacific Islanders have been living a traditionally sustainable life for a long time, centering this Chamorro woman from Guam who is relentlessly leading the fight towards climate justice. And, you know, the 10 million residents of Oceania are among the fr most frontline of frontline communities, as I said, yet they have so much to teach the rest of us. Um, for Indigenous Pacific Islanders, it's their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunties who are passing, really passing down these um, ancestral knowledge, whether that's through medicinal planning um, or traditional seafaring and more. Um, and living on the front lines of this global crisis has also made Pacific Islanders some of the most passionate voices demanding action. We have former Marshall Islands President um, Hilda Hine, who I know is part of this assembly, and her, her daughter, as well as her daughter, uh, Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, who is one of my favorite poets, along with Teresa Siagatonu, Katarina Tewa, and many more who tell eloquent stories about their lived experience as a Pacific Islanders. And if you haven't already, it's really um, crucial, highly suggest following their work. And I just wanted to close, close out by retelling an ancient Chamorro tale that my friend Julian again included in their book called um, Properties of Perpetual Light, which I have right here. Um, and I'm just going to keep it short for the sake of time. But in the old days in Guam, when people lost their connection to their way of life, when rain wouldn't come and people grew wild with hunger, a giant fish was determined to destroy Guam and began to eat the island, one chunk after another. Every day, men of Guam tried to stop it. They used spears and tried in vain to trap with nets they made. Uh, they even called on ancestors to help them. And each day, the women of Guam offered to help catching the giant fish, but the men, forgetting the strength of women, rejected them. One night, while the women were weaving pondulous leaves, the Magahaga, or the elder and or leader among them, had an idea. One by one, the women, old and young, weaved a giant net from their long black hair. They weaved and chanted throughout the night, and by first light, they finished and set the trap. The giant fish got caught, convulsed violently, but couldn't break the net because it was woven with deep spiritual affection. The woman, however, had a hard time hauling the fish ashore. The men heard what was happening and rushed to help the woman, and together they, haul, they hauled the fish, and its meat was shared with everyone. So essentially, the moral is, you know, it was the women's offering of beauty and just love and affection um, was that saved the island. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And then we're going to pass it over to Osprey really quick. But after she gets done, she gets finish speaking, if everyone could like go around and just speak for two minutes on what we can do to increase uh, the amount of women in climate coverage, that would be great. But first, let's hear from Osprey. Yeah, I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us. And it's really awesome to have this panel because um, as I was saying at the opening of the session, um, we know how much narrative and the media is impacting this critical moment of the climate emergency. And we know from the ground that as many of you spoke, indigenous, black, brown, and gender diverse leaders are the backbone of these movements. And so we're very concerned and, and really appreciating all the coverage that all of you have done and looking to what activists, what people on the front lines can do to sort of break open the space to, to get more coverage. This is very important to a lot of the folks who are listening in that you know, there's, there's a desire of also how to, to open those doors more. Um, and I really wanna thank all of you, Antonia, Rachel, um, Karina, um, Andrea, for the incredible coverage that you've done. 
and to, to know that we use very, very precisely the coverage that you have as an example, when we had the Indigenous Women's Divestment Delegations, which we talked about on another panel that we run with uh, um, Michelle Cook, when we went to the banks all over Europe, and we had to have those meetings for divestment from the Dakota Access Pipeline and now moving to line three, we were able to use that coverage as an, as an example from democracy now to show the indigenous and human rights violations that were occurring. So this is real time work that we're using from the media. And I just wanted to point out that relationship between you know, advocacy, action on the ground, change with our governments and financial institutions that we use because we have you know, evidence through the media. And this is really key to all of us. And to lastly uh, lift up what Karina said that um, for those of you who are listening, who want your voices heard, who are also you know, facing that challenge of breaking through to, to other news sources, that's why we created Women Speak. Your stories are welcome. Please reach out to Karina. Um, this is being widely viewed. There are thousands of stories in 15 different category areas, and we want your voices heard. We are the change makers, and we need to change the system of domination of patriarchy and colonialism and racism, and we're going to do that through moving hearts and minds through stories. So with that, I hand the floor back to you, Marquia. Thank you. Sorry, everyone, my dog is barking. Um, so if anybody just wants to kick off with their two minute remarks on what we can do to increase women in uh, climate coverage, that'd be great. Thank you. I can start. Um, well, say that assuming responsibility means decolonizing narratives. It's taking responsibility means stop consuming indigenous territories in the global South. Uh, something that it's really important uh, it's to put in the center the voices of women and the voices of communities that are in the front line in the defense of the future. That it's really urgent. Indigenous communities, we're not just victims of the climate crisis. We are defending territories. We have developed strategies and technologies for 500 years. And that's why, we, why I'm highlighting this. Like the alternatives to the climate crisis are already here. They had been massacred and their voices and their stories needs to be heard. We need more diverse and as Amy said, non-corporative media that can be putting our voices in that conversation. And let me follow up on Andrea and uh, Marquea, great job moderating this panel. Thank you so much for doing that. And I wanna say to Rachel, I have been to Saipan and Guam a number of times. I've never seen such beautiful blue water as Saipan. Um, but and it was wonderful to hear you speak. Um, you know, we had on a woman many years ago from the Red Thread Collective in Guyana, and we were doing something on the U.S. elections, the next segment, and we had our music break, which we usher out guests and then bring in new ones, and we were ushering her out and said, no, I'll be here for the next segment. We said, oh, but it's on the U.S. election. You were talking about activism in Guyana. She said, no, no, no. She said, I think everyone in the world should get to vote for president of the United States. And her point was that the U.S. has so much power. Andrea is talking about the indigenous communities that have been fighting back for so long. We in the United States also have to take responsibility for the fact that the U.S. is the historically largest polluter in the world. And it is absolutely critical that we bust open um, the conversation to include everyone who is affected by it, uh, by our policies as well. Um, and I think, um, you know, as a journalist, how important it is to support independent corporate free media, radio, television, websites, people on the ground that are shaping and telling their own stories. And I'll just end by saying for anyone who has a story anywhere who's watching this anywhere, please send your ideas, guest suggestions to stories at democracynow.org. We are at democracynow.org and we're on Facebook and all um, Instagram, et cetera. And those uh, corporate, uh, what are supposed to be our public commons, but that have been corporatized. But it's so important that we link up with independent media because that's where we're going to get that great depth, the great um, diversity of voices that are the true change makers in the world.
And I'll just piggyback off of Amy, if that's okay, Marquia, um, because it, it ties really well when she said that the green, uh, the U.S. is historically the largest greenhouse gas em emitter in the world, but specifically the U.S. military is the largest greenhouse gas emitter of any government agency in the world. And I briefly mentioned this in my speech of how Pacific Islanders and Pacific Islands have bombarded with military contamination and that historical legacy of injustice from that um, contamination and pollution from military bases, especially in Guam and Marshall Islands, um, is still there, it's still living. And so just, you know, it's something to keep in mind, making those connections and remembering that, you know, climate change, the climate crisis spans all beats, it affects housing, immigration policies, and all the other um, issues that we all care about. Um, and I think it was dropped in the chat that um, we are, I am part of the steering committee of this network called the Uproot Project, which um, is a network for and by environmental justice journalists of color. And so we, um, we welcome a lot of members of the media and journalists um, to support the work that journalists of color are doing in terms of covering climate change and environmental justice, and even aspiring student journalists of color who wants to, you know, shift and cover climate change. Um, thank you to all of you. I, I'll just jump in and add, you know, basically on the question of how, how can we get more of these stories told? I think there's two pieces. One is supporting women of color on the front lines were climate leaders in the ability to tell their own stories and communicate their stories to the press. Um, this is neither of those things are easy to do and it takes support. So however you can create support systems to do that, that's needed. And support journalists who are telling these stories. Um, you have to sort of ask the question, how does an outlet choose what stories to tell and who gets to tell them? And there's usually, if it's, a, if it's a corporate outlet in particular, there's two competing pieces. And that is what will get them more eyes, more clicks? What will more people read? Not necessarily read, we hope read, but click is really the most important thing. Um, and then what supports the status quo that they're trying to support? So if you want to overwhelm the side, which is the status quo that they're trying to support, you have to overwhelm the click side, right? You have to read the stories that we write. It's really important. Um, you have to share them. You have to uh, do as Osprey said, which is, you know, use them. Um, because the more that we are seen as um, purveyors of, of stories that people want to read, um, the more that we will have the ability to tell the stories and we can start acting as a counterweight to that um, a system of the media that only exists to support a status quo, which we are simultaneously trying to challenge. So I think, you know, those are, um, yeah, to me, those are the two biggest pieces, support the people whose stories need to be told and support the storytellers. Thank you, Antonia, just to piggyback on that. Um, I agree with what you said, and I agree with what has been said by the other speakers thus far. I think it's also crucial to highlight the people who are closest to the land and indigenous people. And it's important to recognize that they and healers, organizers, artists are also experts in, in their work and in this work. Um, when I was in graduate school and studying climate and forestry, I saw these voices repeatedly dismissed. And so it doesn't just happen in the media and in storytelling spaces, it really happens at every level. And so um, I think that need to like create support, support systems for doing this work at every level is, is also crucial. Thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, joining the session today. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, going to wrap up this panel and I'll pass it back to you, Osprey. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for the incredible work and let's just keep going because this is um, our moment to change the trajectory we're in and we need you all. We thank you all for your being on the front lines of a very difficult uh, corporate owned space um, and please support all of these uh, storytellers as Antonia and everyone said, you know, uh, all of these outlets really need your support. 
these women who are on the front lines of storytelling need your support. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Marquia. Thank you so much for working with us at We Can and for uplifting BIPOC communities and their stories, but particularly the women and uh, the femmes and uh, gender diverse folks who really need their stories told and for uh, organizing and uh, facilitating this panel. Thank you everyone. And we will see you in all the great spaces that we're in together um, pushing this agenda forward, pushing this agenda forward. Be with us at COP26. See you in COP. See you at COP. See you at COP. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that, um, really exciting to um, really understand, as I was mentioning earlier, that relationship between what's happening on the front lines and on the ground with uh, the leadership of frontline communities um, and indigenous black and brown uh, communities, indigenous communities, and particularly from a gender perspective and ensuring that we do everything we can to, to break open into uh, the larger infrastructure of the media because um, it's not the end all, but it has a very big influence and we're doing everything we can to, to do that within the assembly. Um, we were very fortunate to get some good stories out in the press and we will continue to do that to uplift the voices of so many of the incredible pre presenters at this assembly um, and going forward into the COP and beyond. So with that, I want to start our, our next uh, panel of the day. Very, very excited. Um, it's a two-part panel. Um, we act for climate justice now. And I want to welcome this really profound group of leaders who are presenting on We Act for Climate Justice Now, part one. Thank you all for your really vital work and leadership. Um, uh, we're just, you know, deep supporters of all of you. And uh, I really just wanted to start out with framing a question for all of you about that we would really love to hear from you about your work and how we can act for climate justice now both in the lead up to COP26 um, in November, but of course beyond this moment. Uh, this is one of the most important climate talks since the Paris Agreement because governments have been called to share their commitments. Um, and so we'd love to hear your comments about that, but also beyond, please don't be limited to just that conversation. And um, for those of you who have not been listening all of the six days, which we understand that not everybody has been able to do so, I also did want to highlight that um, you know many civil society organizations uh, actually asked for postponement of COP26 because of the great inequities that were presented by the COP presidency in not providing um, vaccine equity, uh, lots of complications about quarantines and who's paying for them and coming in very late with how all of this was to play out for civil society to truly be represented um, in these spaces and frontline communities um, from indigenous communities to those in the global south uh, to be able to be, be properly represented in spaces that deeply impact their communities and to be part of that decision-making process. That said, many of us are going to COP because it's going forward, but I did want to point out that, you know, this is not being done in an equitable way, and it's really important to bring that into the discourse. Um, so again, yes, we're addressing COP26, but beyond in the work that you've been doing, all of you for many, many, many years, and the deep analysis each of you hold, we're really honored to have you with us. And I'll be introducing the speakers now in the order that they are presenting. First, we're gonna be hearing from Monica Atkins, um, who is the co-executive director of Climate Justice Alliance here in the United States. Then we'll be hearing from Bindu Bandari. She is a program associate uh, at Climate Interactive in Nepal. And then we'll be hearing from Indian, India Logan Riley, who is Maori. They are co-founder of Te Ara Watu from New Zealand. Then we will be hearing from Alexandra Narvaez. She is Sinon Go and a co-fan leader from the Ecuadorian Amazon. Then we'll be hearing from Sunita Narain. She is the Director General for the Center for Science and Environment in India. And then we will be hearing from Diane Duarte. She is the Director of Policy and Strategic Engagement from Madre um, here in the US. And this is just a really profound panel of leaders 
Um, and with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started uh, with you opening comments. Monica, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you all for having me and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all the communities that are represented here today. Um, it is incredibly beautiful and humbling, I must say, to present with each of you and just yeah, be present for the sacredness of Mother Earth and the sake of our peoples today. Um, it's just been so inspiring to hear you know, from so many brilliant organizers and activists this week, and I'm just absolutely honored to be here to lift up um, you know, the importance and the power of frontline community and the voices and our solutions. So thank you for having me. Um, you know, but we are sitting here in the thick of the climate crisis and its impacts, you know, and the reality that frontline communities would bear the burden of it while responding to the needs of their communities really is an illustration for us at the Climate Justice Alliance um, that now is a time more than ever is, is, is critical to lean into the bold and resilient strategies and solutions that are in uh, frontline leadership. You know, from mothers in Detroit to our sisters in Haiti to even those who are in the process of rebuilding after so many storms and wildfires have decimated neighborhoods and, and livelihoods. You know, now is the time to not only take the leadership of front lines, but resource the righteous work that they have been leading for uh, so long. You know, when it comes to the interconnected crisis of democracy, economy, um, and even white supremacy and, and climate chaos in particular, you know, we've been building solutions that work for decades now. Um, unfortunately, you know, international bodies such as the United Nations haven't been able to get from under control of capitalists and Western power and interest. You know, and if they had truly listened to the front lines on the, of the, on the climate crisis, you know, we, would, we wouldn't even be here right now. You know, if we imagine that the UNF Triple C had actually listened to what scientists said, you know, we would all be in a very different place. But, you know, the US empire and other Western empires, um, you know, they, they supported and, and never have really had interest in adhering to the agreements that first don't benefit their military and their economic might. So, you know, we must not forget that the US didn't even you know, adopt the Kyoto Protocol, and that would have at least limited emissions. And we can't forget about the infamous Paris Agreement with so many false promises that masquerade themselves as false solutions, um, you know, that masquerade themselves as solutions that end up will sacrificing, you know, all of our communities, and especially when we think about Article 6. So, you know, we have to be clear, we have to be resolute in honoring, you know, the experiences of frontline communities who really know that, you know, there's no quick techno fix to repair Mother Earth. You know, rather a responsibility of all our governments to end this extractive economy and reduce emissions at their source and shut down industrial pollution. Um, you know, there's loopholes for carbon markets and unproven techno fixes that only serve to enrich uh, polluting and corporations while increasing harm and devastation for our communities. And a prime example of this would be allowing for net zero emissions. And, you know, now rather than really getting real about what's happening in such a dire time of continued crisis for our communities, the U.S. is supporting another attempt by the U.N. to keep the most impacted out of policy discussions that will literally mean life or death for our people in this planet. So it's like if they had their way, you know, this year, so many who actually hold the solutions and have been impacted the most by these interconnected crises, they won't, won't be able to attend COP because they aren't vaccinated or they don't have the same resources. So again, you know, yet again, the international community is reminding us exactly what they really think of us and who they really place value on. But, you know, we are clear who the real, real experts are here. You know, it's the ones who's, who have lived through the, the, the impacts of climate change, industrial pollution, and, and oppression for so many decades. And there can't be any solutions about us without us at this point. So, you know, we support and we also stand in solidarity with, you know, our communities and the people's movements in the South and the global South and call for the postponement of COP. You know, but if it is still 
uh, to be held and goes forth, you know, we will make sure that we're there also to hold them accountable because we can't allow the, you know, international community to effectively erase our peoples again through exclusionary policies under this guise of COVID and urgency. You know, when I think about what's happening here in the U.S., you know, there's so many examples and just inspiring models that are up and running and also ready to be replicated and scaled now. You know, these models show us rather than tell us how to how to build safe, regenerative energy, uh, energy democracy and sustainable community development projects that are built in partnership with and also benefit the communities. You know, and these projects, they also stop carbon emissions, and they also benefit the communities through, um, you know, green and healthy jobs, living wages, policies that address racism, self-determination, and economic inequality, and really the uh, deterioration of, of democracy. You know, ultimately, what we need to see is our government move away from uh, extractive and dying fossil fuel economy to a truly regenerative one. You know, right now in the U.S., there has been a lot of talk um, about, you know, Biden and his spending packages. And currently, like Biden's Build Back Better and infrastructure plans are riddled with market-based solutions. Um, you know, while we kind of have made some inroads, like in investments in the community, in our communities that, you know, will have long-lasting impacts, such as like the paid sick leave, affordable housing, care and public transit, you know, you know, the measures that promote the market-based schemes and quick techno fixes, they only accelerate climate chaos and, and harm our people. So the U.S. can't really act as if, you know, they're leading in the fight here against climate change, you know, being largely responsible for it, regardless of which party holds uh, power. You know, so we really can't preach to the global community about adhering to commitments when it won't even, when, you know, the U.S. won't even give up its own addiction to fossil fuel. So there are several things that the, the U.S., you know, must do immediately, which includes stop su subsidizing the fossil fuel industry and stop all future projects and channel that energy into building back fossil free, you know, include no false promises that masquerade themselves as solutions and policies at home and abroad, because we really can't stop climate change if we're going to continue to enable, you know, the largest corporations to pollute and create schemes like carbon capture um, and storage that, you know, these things don't even work and actually requires to build more pipelines um, and continue the harmful practice of sacrifice zones. Um, geoengineering, as well as carbon capture and storage, nuclear and other big industry creations are just a few, are just actually more of kind of the same things that accelerate climate change. So the reality, um, you know, the reality I would say is that we must reduce and ultimately eliminate emissions at the source and begin the hard work of forging a just transition right now. You know, it's time for the U.S. to take responsibility for its historic role in the creation of this mess um, through reparations and sensible policy that doesn't continue harmful practice of sacrifice zones um, here at home or abroad. And, you know, the supposed experts have already had their opportunity for decades. And so now it's really time for them to put their money where their mouth is and really honor, you know, the wisdom and the expertise of Black, Brown, Indigenous, Asian and Pacific Islander and other oppressed people and community who have really paid the price for so long. So, you know, at the Climate Justice Alliance, we often say we don't want just a transition, but we want a just transition. And so that's what we will uh, hold the, the U.S. and those at COP accountable for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for those really important remarks and the in incredible work of the Climate Justice Alliance. And we're putting uh, links in the chat about uh, CJA and also the very important framework uh, that your organization put together that is an in-depth analysis of just transition. And just so you know, um, in addition to uh, the assembly having uh, sent out a call to action to all the governments in the world and financial institutions. We also sent a framework page uh, with existent frameworks that organizations like yours and others have been working on for decades from the movements about what the solutions already are and the climate justice frameworks we want them to be looking at. And we've included uh, your reports there. 
Um, we've also put a link in the chat to Hoodwink and the Hot House, uh, which goes into a lot of what Monica talked about regarding false solutions. And particularly, um, I'd ask Catherine also to drop into the link um, our analysis around Article 6, uh, because that kind of gets into the weeds um, uh, of some of the negotiations coming up. But it's important for people to understand. So if you could drop that as well. Um, and again, just to echo, you know, we're talking about postponement for the COP for all the reasons Monica spelled out so powerfully. In no way do we want um, um, there not to be immediate action by governments. Uh, it is a calling out to the injustice. Um, so thank you, Monica, for bringing that up. Really appreciate it. Um, and now let's go ahead and hear from Bindu. Hi everyone, Namaste. I'm Bindu Bandari and I'm a climate change communicator. Currently, I work as outreach and engagement manager at not for profit think tank called Climate Interactive. I'm grateful to be a part of this inspiring panel. Thank you so much for having me. And I would like to take this opportunity to share two stories. The story of women in mountains of Nepal and my story of working in climate science. I come from Nepal, one of the least developed countries in the Hindukus Himalaya region. The Hindukus Himalaya region, the HKS, extends from Afghanistan in the west to Myanmar in the east and it is the source of 10 large Asian river systems that provide livelihood opportunities to around 240 million people living in this region. An assessment report produced by the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development ECMOR, in 2019 reported that even in the optimistic scenario of limiting the global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, the HKS region will likely be at least 0.3 degrees Celsius warmer than the global average and the Himalayas will lose one third of its glaciers. In a region with such a fragile ecosystem, the women remain highly impacted by climate change. In 2019, together with two other colleagues, I co-led a storytelling project exploring the linkage between climate change and labor migration in the mountain regions of eastern Nepal. With the increasing forces of globalization, thousands of men from mountain regions are out migrating for better income opportunities while women are left behind to manage household work, take care of the family, and continue a traditional livelihood option, primarily agriculture. These women in the, the mountains did not have to do what climate change meant, but they knew that the relationship between human and nature have altered in the recent years. Their traditional yak farming occupation have become less profitable and they did not have skills and resources for the diversification of their livelihood. While women's rules and responsibilities have taken a new direction in the recent years, the systemic structures and policy related to the ownership of land and decision making largely remains the same, dominated by men. As climate change increases the intensity and frequency of extreme events, Lack of policies addressing the gender relations and specific needs of women might exacerbate the existing gender disparities. We can see that many countries have now included the term gender in their national climate policies and adaptation plans, but often it is oversimplified as women versus men. This one size fits all narrative is one of the hurdles in attaining true environmental justice. Meeting well below 2 degrees Celsius target of the Paris Agreement does not necessarily guarantee fair and just society. As our climate change negotiations and processes get more and more fixated in our numbers such as net zero, important dimensions of lived experiences and the role of social institutions that shape power relations in the society might be overlooked. So how do we build a society that is just and inclusive? And how can we share our responsibilities fairly to mitigate climate change? Well, for me, there is no one right answer and I do not recommend any technocratic quick fixes. It is crucial to acknowledge the diversity between and within stakeholder groups and understand that the responses to climate change are defined by the intersections of age, class, gender, ethnicity, caste and geographical locations. 
Thus, it is imperative to have a disaggregated data for informed decision making in this matter. The notion of women empowerment simply through assigning quota based participation in projects and decision making is rudimentary. Be it in the adaptation program in the rural mountains of Nepal or high level forums at COP, tokenization of women is evident in different forms. Moving away from such tokenism needs intervention in multiple spheres such as science, policy making, governance, financial systems, and media. At a personal and professional capacity, I have been using interactive climate tools that help people see the interconnectedness, feedback, delays, and non-linearities of climate systems. These tools called NROADS and CROADS are co-developed by Climate Interactive and MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, and they are available for free at climateinteractive.org. I started working in climate change since 2014. When I started, I could literally count the number of Nepalese women in climate science on the fingers of one hand. As career opportunities for young women were very limited, some of my peers could not continue their work on climate change despite their interest. Enabling and safe spaces for women, especially from the global south, to access the resources and funding for climate change is limited. Research and policies on climate sensitive sectors such as water, tourism and agriculture have minimal involvement of women professionals. The situation is gradually improving but very gradually. Climate change as we all know is uh, the defining issue of this century but this is also an opportunity to not just fix the climate but improve our socio-economic structures and create a just equitable society. For everyone, increasing leadership and ownership of women in climate science is one of the powerful approaches towards climate justice and I am proud to be contributing to the best of my capacity in this journey. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, that is Bindu from Nepal. Uh, really honored to have your comments uh, and your work from Nepal uh, shared in this assembly. And with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to India. Welcome, India. Yes, uh, thank you um, so much for having me. And um, I feel so honored to be alongside so many incredible speakers. It's been an amazing uh, few days, actually. Um, and so, yeah, kia ora, morena, hello, good morning uh, from my part of the world. Uh, my name is India. Uh, um, so I'm from the nations of Ngāti Kangunu, Rongomai Wahine and Rangitane uh, on the east coast of the North Island of Aotearoa, which is colonially known as New Zealand. Um, my community is in a place called the Hiratonga Plains, um, and it is my little patch of paradise. Protecting this place is why I do what I do, and so it can remain a sanctuary uh, for my younger siblings and for future generations moving forward so that they can enjoy the gifts that I grew up with um, in this incredible landscape. Um, I wasn't entirely sure about what I could bring or, or, or what additional wisdom I could add um, to this incredible group, um, but I will do my best to, to share some of the perspectives from here. And I am very aware that what I share from back home in my stories um, is not the same for all Indigenous peoples everywhere. It's very much grounded in my cultural background and my uh, ancestral lineages. Um, but there are learnings and themes that we can draw on um, as I share these stories. And what I want to start with actually is a, is a portion of our origin, um, of our creation stories. And that is um, back a long time ago, um, Mother Earth and, and, and Sky Father, or Papa Tsunuku and Ranginui as we know them, um, lived in this tight embrace, They're so in love with each other um, that they held each other tight and their children were born in that, in that little world in between. Uh, and over much uh, deliberation and disagreement, the children managed to eventually separate um, Sky Father and Mother Earth uh, into the world that we know today. Um, following that, uh, Papa Tunuku or Mother Earth gave the most richest soil of herself, um, this deep red earth, um, to one of her children, 
um, to craft the first person out of. And it is from that first person that we're all descended, but it is also through knowing that we were made of the earth that we can identify how we're ancestrally related to everything else around us, the plants, the trees, the fish, the birds, um, other people, um, even the coral um, and the water and everything like that are all descended from those children that were born between uh, the embrace of our Sky Father and Earth Mother. Now I'm going to jump forward a little bit and uh, talk about my own community's experiences. Um, and we know that we are very much of the Pacific because our island was pulled up from the ocean as a fish uh, by Maui. It was made famous by the movie Moana. Um, and uh, yeah, so he, he had this hook that he fished up the, um, our island with. And that then really embeds in our stories the relationship that we have to the rest of the Pacific and naming that we are of the ocean. Um, and also that... Um, and it's an acknowledgement of our migration across the Pacific to Aotearoa, um, which was one of the last islands to be arrived to um, in the exploration of the Pacific. Now, where I come from is quite unique in terms of the colonial story of New Zealand, uh, because we had land taken by the colonial government in order to obtain the oil that was in it. But actually, the majority of stolen land in New Zealand is, is used for agriculture. It's used for farming, um, particularly dairy and other monocrops, um, beef. We ship meat overseas for other people to eat for some strange reason. Um, and so there's this legacy there of the stolen land being used for primarily agriculture, although in part for other extractive resources like gas from fracking and, and that kind of thing. And this actually matches with the emissions um, of New Zealand. So the emissions profile of New Zealand um, shows us that, uh, that about half of our emissions come from agriculture. And so there you have that relationship between what the land was stolen for and then what um, New Zealand's contributions to the climate crisis are. And so we have this displacement of indigenous peoples in order to pursue um, a way of relating with the land that very much boils it down to functionality and being able to grow a set of a few things. Um, now, my own community, we sit on the coast, we are within the next few decades going to go underwater. And so even in the land back movement, it, it's becoming an emerging question of how do we relate to land that we can't actually get back because of the climate crisis? How can we minimize that loss of land um, through the activism that we do? And that's what has really pushed me into this work. When I was little, I planned to be an archaeologist, um, but I got distracted by the end of the world and ended up in these kinds of spaces. And I think that really speaks to the experience of a lot of Indigenous peoples, which is we don't necessarily choose to do this work. I mean, I wake up and go, this is the glamorous work I want to do. It is the work that we have to do because the violence of the system brings it upon us and, and, and requires us to do that. Um, and I, I want to jump back to the origin story. And in my own journey through activism has required a journey of decolonization and, and coming present to who I am now. Um, and as a non-binary person um, who is often misread as a woman, um, that has been a negotiation in itself with the colonial government. And what we've found through some amazing research that has been done by some of our Māori leaders is that prior to colonization, we had at least five genders and that people could be multiple genders at the same time. And for me, this is very much a reflection of the diversity that Mother Earth gifted to us. You know, all around us, we have all these incredible expressions of life. And so in that, I see an essence of Mother Earth even being a trans woman, so having all this diversity and expression and ways of being and manifesting that were very much reflected in, in Māori frameworks and approaches. And so when we come to bringing through gender justice here in Aotearoa, it's really important that that doesn't just boil down to the gender binary because that is the habit of the colonial structure, which is to strip back diversity, to boil it down to the minimum the nothing and to deny all this diversity and its destruction of the environment and of biodiversity and of our genders and our indigeneity. 
And so for us and, and our work that we're doing in my own youth organization, it's very important that when we're bringing these solutions forward, that we're also embracing the liberation of the diversity itself that colonization has sought has sought to oppress. And so looking forward to COP, um, you know, doing a big jump because I've got a short amount of time left and I want to leave plenty of room for all the other amazing speakers. Um, funding willing, uh, my little team will be there. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here really for communicating the origins of the climate crisis, very much naming it as the final outcome of the colonial project. And being in the colonial motherland of the UK is a storytelling moment that I think we should really be urgently telling. Um, for me to be in the UK is very awkward, um, having to negotiate with the British government that stole all of my land um, is very painful and uncomfortable, but it does open up a window through which we can um, really push back on some of these false solutions and narratives where the global north is trying to position itself as a savior once more. And we don't want that savior. We don't want their solutions because they require us to negate our indigenous selves. Um, and that does greater harm than, um, than anything I can imagine to have to boil down my world into the lack of imagination that is the colonial uh, landscape. And so I also just want to add that we are seeing a revival of empire um, with the agreements between the US and the UK to give nuclear powered submarines to Australia. They will be bringing back um, imperial forces into the Pacific that we've seen come time and time and time again. And so also when we're talking about land back, when we're talking about dismantling empire and pushing back against these colonial capitalist forces, um, that we also have to advocate for a return of the Pacific uh, to our Pacific nations, to bringing that, um, that imagery of the fish connected to the rest of the ocean into play. Um, and kicking out empires like the US um, from our islands um, and reclaiming our oceans so that we can be a full, vibrant indigenous selves able to host and welcome all of these other beautiful communities that are present in this gathering um, in, in all of our fullness as women, as men, as um, non-binary folk, as trans folk, that we can all just be safe and healthy and joyful. And I think that's ultimately what I'd like to see come out of this work, ideally. Um, and that beyond COP, we can um, really embrace that climate just future um, where we are liberating everyone. Um, and that COP can be a springboard towards that. Um, and so I hope I've managed to share some, some nice little gems. Um, I wasn't very sure about what to say because there's so much uh, beautiful knowledge uh, in this space. And so um, hopefully there was something in there for you and, and for your young people. Because I will say that so many of our young people are coming through just beautifully further ahead in their decolonized journey. And so particularly for our trans and non-binary young people that we can create climate just spaces, gender just spaces um, that are considerate of all of their fullness and beauty. That is a reflection um, of Mother Earth. Um, yeah, that's me. Kia ora. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, India, for your really powerful comments. And you have uh, added a wonderful contribution and many, many gems in all that you said. And thank you also for lifting up the gender diversity of your community and Indigenous views, um, but also views that we all need to adopt and learn from and move out of these non-binary spaces. So thank you very much for spotlighting that um, because we are working towards the just future we want. And that includes gender justice, racial justice and rights for everyone. So thank you very much for that. And also, um, I don't know if you heard our session yesterday, but we had uh, um, a wonderful conversation uh, with a colleague who's working on rights of nature in your homelands and talking about um, the Wanganui River. And I was just sharing a story about what I had learned from some Maori elders about I am the river and the river is me and really seeing the land as you so beautifully said as our ancestor, our relative and just bringing that forward again of that worldview of, of not being separate from 
our, our mother, father, earth, and um, how that can change how we create the new world that we're working to birth at this, this crisis time. So thank you very much, beautiful comments. And now I would like to hand the floor over to Alexandra. And um, I believe we will be needing language translations to so just to remind folks uh, for the interpretation button. Alexandra, the floor is yours, thank you. Buenas tardes a todos. Es un gusto de estar en este espacio. Me siento muy contenta. Eh, mi nombre es Alexandra Narváez. Soy de madre cofán, de padre mestizo. Soy casada, tengo dos niñas. No soy una activista. Soy una mujer defensora de nuestra selva, de nuestro territorio. Crecí jugando en el río, corriendo en la selva, viviendo libres. Hace muchos años atrás, nuestro territorio es invadido por mineras. Primero con mineras artesanales de afuera. En el 2017 encontramos maquinaria ya contaminando nuestro río Aguarico. La comunidad Cofán Sinangüe realizamos una asamblea urgente donde decidimos crear una ley propia, una guardia propia con la guía de nuestros mayores para defender nuestro territorio de las grandes y pequeñas mineras que vulneraron nuestros derechos, como la, eh, el derecho a la alimentación, al agua, al medio ambiente, contaminando el río Aguarico y poniendo en riesgo nuestra vida, la vida de todos los cofanes y de toda la gente de la provincia de Sucumbíos. Por lo tanto, denunciamos legalmente poniendo una acción de protección, lo cual los jueces fallaron a nuestro favor. Fue para nosotros una lucha histórica. Ahora nuestro caso está en la Corte Constitucional y fue seleccionada para el desarrollo de jurisprudencia, pero la Corte aún no nos ha llamado, no nos ha convocado audiencia. Para nosotros es muy importante esta audiencia, porque deben, deben escuchar nuestros criterios, nuestros pensamientos, porque sin nosotros harían como siempre al Estado que ha hecho, decidir por nosotros. Y mientras más pasa el tiempo, el gobierno sigue con la idea de duplicar la explotación petrolera y minera. ¿A dónde piensan que van a explotarla? En nuestros territorios. Y eso pone en riesgo nuestra vida. Y la Corte tiene la oportunidad de junto a nosotros desarrollar una buena jurisprudencia, una buena herramienta que nos permita el derecho a ser consultados, pero a que podamos dar nuestro consentimiento y que ese consentimiento sea respetado. Y también pues como mujer indígena, indígenas, nos jugamos la vida protegiendo nuestro territorio, nuestra vida, enseñando a nuestros hijos la importancia de, de la selva y encargadas de transmitir el conocimiento ancestrales de generación en generación para mitigar el impacto de la crisis climática que afecta no solo a los pueblos indígenas, afecta a todo el mundo. Para la comunidad Cufán Sinangüe, nuestro territorio es vital porque lo tenemos todo, nuestra alimentación, nuestra farmacia, nuestra vida, nuestra vivienda, cultura. Sin nuestro territorio, no hay vida. Cofán sin territorio, no es Cofán. Cofán muere. También soy, formo parte de la Guardia Indígena, como les había hablado hace rato. Eh, represento a la Guardia de la Comunidad Sinangüe. Es un honor hablar de ellas. Y también como la primera Guardia Mujer, ha sido un reto muy duro y muy emocionante de, forma, de formar parte de este grupo operativo, que estamos vigilantes de nuestro territorio, cuidando, caminando. Como mujer ha sido muy duro porque me ha tocado dejar la comunidad, dejar mi familia, para salir a monitorear nuestro territorio, para 
participar en reuniones, capacitaciones, o incluso para estar en la intemperie, bajo la lluvia, bajo el sol, caminando, con mucha hambre y con mucha sed, cuidando nuestro territorio y conociendo los caminos donde salían de cacería nuestros padres, nuestros abuelos. Tener ese orgullo de conocer dónde caminaban nuestros padres, dónde caminaba mi padre, viendo eh, los saladeros, lugares medicinales donde nuestras abuelas, nuestras madres iban a coger cuando nuestros, eh, los hijos se enfermaban, lugares sagrados donde nuestros ancestros estaban ahí descansando, que nos dan la fuerza, eso me da la fuerza como mujer de seguir luchando por dejar un legado a, nos, a mis hijas y también decirle al Estado y al mundo que nuestros territorios no están vacíos, hay vida y no permitiremos que lo destruyan. También soy presidenta de la Asociación de Mujeres Chameco de la Comunidad Icofán de Sinangüe. Decirles que somos un grupo de mujeres defensoras de nuestro territorio, quienes luchamos y decidimos y decimos no a la minería, sí a la vida. Nuestra resistencia seguirá siempre de, por defender nuestra casa a costa de nuestra vida. Nuestro territorio, nuestra vida. Somos río, somos agua, somos selva y por ende la vamos a defender. También agradecer a las ONGs aliadas quienes han estado ayudándonos con logística, parte legal, técnica, con talleres, con, dándonos conocimientos, cómo defender legalmente nuestro territorio. Con, han estado en nuestra lucha Amazon Front Life. Alianza Seibo y más, han sido un apoyo muy grande para la comunidad de Icofán de Sinangüe, quienes agradecemos por ir de la mano con nosotros en esta lucha de cuidar y proteger nuestro territorio para que estemos eh, libres de contaminación, ya no haya este cambio climático que nos está afectando a todas las mujeres, como mamás, como hermanas, digo que nos está afectando porque ya no podemos ir a, a nuestro territorio, eh, a la selva, a cosechar nuestros frutos, porque ya, ya este cambio climático ya no se sabe, hay desbordamientos de ríos, eh, ya llueve, ya no podemos, la más afectada somos nosotros como mujeres. Nuestra casa está en peligro y el miedo nos invade de pensar que nuestros territorios serán destruidos, que nuestros territorios se van a acabar por este estado que quiere desarrollo y no piensa en nuestras vidas. Si no nos unimos, esto se va a acabar. Le invito a todas las mujeres del mundo que nos levantemos y luchemos en defensa de nuestros hijos por nuestros en defensa de nuestro territorio, por nuestros hijos. Juntos somos más. Así que, mujeres, levantémonos, que nuestra voz ya es hora de ser escuchadas, que nuestra voz tiene poder. Si se desaparece los pueblos y territorios indígenas, también se acabará el mundo, desaparecerá el mundo, porque nosotras, por nosotros, respiran un aire sano aún. Somos aún el pulmón del mundo. Si se acaba, los pueblos indígenas se acaban. Así que, compañeras, eh, les invito a unirse a esta lucha de defensa de territorio. Soy una mujer que sí me duele ver cómo destruyen nuestros territorios, cómo están eh, en riesgo de, de exterminio. Porque si no luchamos con nuestra vida misma, eh, nadie va a venir a... Eh, ayudarnos. Tenemos que levantarnos ahora, eh, ver a nuestros hijos y esa fuerza que nos, que nos transmitan para seguir luchando por estos territorios 
no solo los pueblos indígenas o no solo las mujeres indígenas, todas las mujeres, toda la gente, hombres y mujeres, tenemos que, eh, les invito a unirnos a esta lucha. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Alexandra. Muchas gracias por joining us. Um, and yes, we just really um, want to thank you for your powerful words and your passion. And uh, I wanted to let you know that we have had uh, several conversations and deliberations over the last days around uh, women land defenders, land defenders in Latin America. We know it is one of the deadliest regions in the world to stand up as a land defender and literally, as you said, putting your bodies on the line to protect your territories, your forests, your water, your lands. And uh, it's, a, it's such a deeply serious issue um, that we need to keep talking about it again and again. And uh, later we will be sure to reach out to you because we're working very closely on the Escazú Agreement, uh, which is affecting Latin America and the Caribbean region on how to, to work at many different levels from the ground to the government level uh, for the protection of the environment with human rights, with indigenous mm -hmm. rights combined. And uh, we must defend the defenders of the land. And we thank you for your courage and your strength um, in your community. Thank you very, very much. Um, and with that, uh, we will go to yes. Sunita Narain, uh, um, who is from India. Please go ahead. We will now hear from Sunita. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the Global Women's Assembly for Climate Justice. It is really very important what you are doing, what we are all doing together to raise the voice of climate change. But with that, the voice of the most marginalized, the most unrepresented communities who are crying for climate justice. So the meeting that you will have that we are all participating in is absolutely crucial. You have asked me to speak on the subject of protecting water and leading fossil fuel resistance. I work and live in India, in Delhi. We do not need to be told about climate change. I'm often asked this question that, do Indians even understand climate change? And it, 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 it's a rather patronizing question that I often get that, you know, how you don't know what climate change is. This is something that we in the Western world understand. But, you know, what do you know about climate change? The fact is the farmers of India, the poor of India do not call it climate change, but they understand what is happening on the un on the ground. They understand today that weather is changing, that is becoming more and more weird. And they also will tell you to your face that this is not the natural variation of weather that that they have seen over their generations. This is unprecedented and this is devastating. Today we are seeing more extreme rain in India, which is leading to more floods, leading to more droughts. We are seeing an intensification of tropical cyclones, which, as you will very well understand, destroys the coping ability of communities to be able to survive. The fact is a cyclone is not a single day event. It is an event which cripples livelihoods of communities, takes away the wherewithal of survival. And it, cyclone after cyclone is destroying their ability to be able to cope. And that is why we are beginning to see such high levels of migration, internal migration that is happening from in, in every part of our world. Now, it is here that we need to understand the relevance of water in the age of climate change. The fact is, with climate change, we will begin to see more rain, but in fewer number of rainy days, which means that countries like India will see more floods. Now, this then means that to be able to survive, 
we need the ability to be able to hold the rain when it where it falls we need the ability to build and rejuvenate our water bodies which then in turn requires us to work with local communities because we know that we cannot manage natural resources without the active involvement control and participation of communities and this is where the we need to deepen democracy we need to rebuild the institutions of governance at our village level and in rural india across uh, the the countries uh, of the south so that we can better live with the extremes of climate change that we are seeing today it's also an opportunity because you know this is where the incredible possibility exists where if you rebuild rural economies you reinvest in building the resilience in rural economies you create new livelihoods for the future you build an ability to be able to not just withstand climate change but actually build a, a green economies for the future green economies are not a smart word green economies are about communities putting a face to the challenge of climate change and i think this is where for us the the the, the very urgency of protecting water comes in it's also about protecting water because we are beginning to see more and more waste water more and more sewage reaching our uh, our rivers we are destroying our water bodies and as a result of it communities today are finding it difficult to be able to find clean drinking water to drink and we know the vicious cycle that comes without drinking water and therefore then the the huge health burden so for me the the, the and for all of us the concept of climate justice must translate down to the 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 investment that we require in rebuilding the resilience in local communities who can then protect their water who can rebuild their local ecosystem who can create ecological wealth uh, or 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 wealth out of their ecological natural capital and this is also where the world is today talking about nature based solutions i'm sure you have heard about it nature based solutions are playing a very big role in the whole conversation of what is called net zero why because the world is realizing that they cannot reduce the emissions at the scale and pace they need they cannot decarbonize they are completely addicted to the fossil fuel economy so the new terminology is we will build nature based solutions what does this mean we will be able to plant trees we will uh, green our environment so that we can create more space for sequestration of carbon dioxide and that countries will then be on a net zero which means that they will live within the ability of either their own country or what they will do outside their country to plant the trees to be able to sequester their carbon dioxide now again we have to understand who whose land these trees are going to be planted we need to ask today on the backs of the very poor we are talking about net zero we are not factoring in the fact that large parts of the world it is the poorest who today live in the forests of the world the the, the national parks the uh, the um, um the um the protected areas that we have built the whole conservation history in my part of the world i can speak with great sense of understanding has been done on the backs of the very poor we do not have wilderness areas we have habitats we have areas where people live and today we have done conservation not in a way that they benefit but in a way that they lose out now in the whole concept of nature based solutions how will we ensure that local communities benefit 
how will we ensure that their land rights are recognized that the forest produce that grows on their lands is theirs to be able to earn from is theirs to be able to build livelihoods from or is this going to be another way a land grab in which the rich of the world are going to be able to talk about nature based solutions in which the lands of the poor are again appropriated this time not for conservation but for sequestering carbon dioxide so these are the challenges for me when i and for all of us as we talk about this future that we look at the existential threat of climate change as it, which is staring us in the face today we know and that is something that we all understand the link with fossil fuel we understand the fact that it is the world's addiction to fossil fuel that has brought us to this point but we also understand today that fossil fuel is the cheapest source of energy for vast numbers of people in the world and so energy access is also a very important part of this future as we go forward so as much as we need resistance to fossil fuel we also need to talk about the need for energy access for all still too many women in the world cook on biomass too many women in the world suffer deadly air pollution impact because they are using biomass fuels and this is impacting their bodies their lungs this is not acceptable this energy transition this energy transformation requires energy for the poor to be secured So we're really glad to to have these comments from our colleague uh, Sunita Narain from India and her really powerful intervention there. And again, just also spelling out some of the details of the problem of nature based solutions, which has sort of been um, a uh, sorry a co opted term. Um, you know, I'm really glad that she pointed out, you know, the problem with nature-based solutions, which again, we are uh, highlighting in several reports. And again, the problem of net zero, we'll continue to put in the chat links to the details and nuances of the problem with these false solutions. Um, we don't want greenwashing, we need real solutions. So I really appreciate her intervention in that um, and, and standing for really articulating that so clearly to us. So um, I would now like to hand the floor over to Diana Duarte. Thank you, Diana. Thank you very much. Hello, and, and so glad and so inspired to be here with you all in this assembly. Um, as Osprey mentioned, I'm Diana Duarte. I'm the Director of Policy and Strategic Engagement for MADRE, um, and I'm joining you from the unceded land of the Lenape people in, in New York. Um, MADRE is an international women's human rights organization and feminist fund that partners with grassroots groups facing war and environmental disaster worldwide. And in our work, we help to make sure that people who are facing these overlapping crises can meet their community's most urgent needs and create uh, long-term social change. And one of the things that's been really clear in all our, our years of work confronting these dangers is, is this, that in order to recover and transform, we need to make major shifts to change fundamentally how we live and, and how we govern. And so this goes beyond you know, landing simply on a new set of policy proposals or technocratic bureaucratic fixes. Um, we already know that too often these take the form of false solutions as has come up a few times already in this session, whether it's carbon trading that puts a price on pollution or agrofuels that end up driving up driving land grabs that displace people. And so we need to start from a transformation in, in values to achieve the change that we need to reject our extractive economies and to embrace caring and regenerative approaches. And that's what can lead to the real change making we need like more effective policy solutions like bans on polluting activities and fossil fuels, like massive new public spending, like climate reparations. And to get to that, 
a lot of hope lies inside of the grassroots feminist approaches that push us towards reevaluating our values and, and transforming those fundamental values in ways that can better allow us to confront climate breakdown. Um, for one, a feminist lens can help reveal that our policy approaches are driven often by deeply patriarchal, colonial, and binary assumptions. Um, you know, things that you know, we may not even recognize overtly, but, you know, where we're divided into two and what are considered feminine values like cooperation, care and connection are denigrated. Meanwhile, those that are coded as masculine, like competition, violence and domination are privileged. And so that leads to prioritizing a fundamentally colonial worldview in our policymaking, especially that sees the earth as an infinite resource for our exploitation and for unrestrained uh, profit seeking. And, you know, indeed, one of the, the biggest obstacles to addressing climate change is the surge of right wing and authoritarian movements worldwide that value the hierarchical over the collective, the ultra nationalist over the internationalist, which mirror common uh, patriarchal values. In contrast, what is at the heart of both feminist and climate justice organizing is a democratic drive for people and communities to be able to decide their own futures. And that is also why the globalized authoritarian right so often targets those movements. You know, I'm thinking of the murders of land defenders and climate justice organizers like Berta Caceres, um, or thinking about, you know, so many indigenous and black land defenders who are under threat in frontline communities worldwide as, as Alexandra just spoke about. And so, you know, to overcome these dangers, we have to imagine and enact both policies and ways of living where care for people, planet and sustainable futures is prioritized above all. And we've already seen for generations how black, brown, indigenous and rural women um, and communities have been doing the work of caring not only for their own communities, but also for the planet, whether they're preserving and exchanging seeds, whether they're passing down traditional knowledge um, and safeguarding our, our world's biodiversity. And this work, this care work is regularly undervalued, invisibilized, or even attacked, even though it's the life sustaining work that is fundamental to absolutely everything. And so, you know, grassroots frontline climate defenders have long been living out and calling for a vision of feminist regenerative economy centered around care. And we have the opportunity, more than the opportunity, the responsibility to learn from, from the models that they've already developed. So at Madre, as I mentioned, we partner with grassroots feminists and women-led groups around the world who are at the front lines of climate breakdown. And so I think immediately of the work of some of our partners who are bringing feminist economies to life. For example, our partners in Palestine right now are creating urban greenhouses, growing food in kitchen gardens and creating sustainable economies for locally grown food. Um, our partners in Sudan have created the country's first ever women farmers union to build collective par uh, power and to share tools and resources for sustainable uh, farming. And these are the kinds of local feminist economies that are already seated around the world and that need to be uplifted. Um, Alongside this work to build local economies of care in places that are marked by crisis, we also use policy and advocacy work to help amplify our partners' voices for peace and environmental justice and make sure that they are heard in the halls of power, whether it's their own village council or at the UN Security Council or beyond. You know, because to create effective climate policy, you know, the expertise of people in local communities must inform policymaking at every level. And that's especially since grassroots organizers often bring a political perspective that's born of lived experience and informed by values of cooperation over competition, of care for people and planet over corporate profits. And these are the values that we need to see shaping policy. And that was our thinking, for example, when Madre organized um, a congressional briefing that was hosted by Representative Deb Holland, then Representative Deb Holland, who has since become the first Indigenous uh, U.S. Secretary of the, uh, of the Interior. And at that briefing, some of our Indigenous partners from all over the world, women from the U.S., from Nepal and Tanzania, shared a truly bold and interconnected vision of what a just transition can look like. They were able to make the links that we all need to make between the pandemic we're facing, capitalism, and the uh, climate crisis. And they talked also about how their 
generations long oppression as indigenous peoples not only cuts them off from basic rights and vital services, but also how these targeted attacks on their roles as stewards of land and ecosystems undermines community resilience. And they showed ultimately how their priorities and perspectives offer some of the best policy advice that governments could hope to have. And so finally, I just wanna say a quick word about how we can best mobilize the people power that we need, because ultimately we won't be able to get to these very transformational shifts in climate action that we need without collective international cooperation. And thankfully, there's already approaches that are being modeled in both the climate justice and feminist movements worldwide. So just as the need to understand the links between social movements has never been greater, we're already beginning to build the muscles to do that. You know, our movements are, are increasingly making linkages across issues like sustainability, feminism, peace, and economic justice. And we see that interconnectedness driving the movements to block pipelines like line three, drawing allies from across the world and across movements. We see it in the growing conversation around the related needs to close military bases and end the massive carbon emissions of US militarism while investing in, in social goods and human rights. And so being able to make those connections contributes to our mobilizing power. It pulls people from different perspectives and different places into a common cause so that we can fight together for a more just, feminist, caring, and beautiful future. So um, with that, I'll stop and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Diana, for those great comments um, and to all of the panelists. Um, and I wanted to um, you know, just make a few comments and then go back to uh, each of you, we just have a few moments. I'm always apologizing for the short time of these panels because these conversations really require, you know, a sitting around the table for days and really diving in. Um, but uh, thank you for, you know, the, the, the fact of these time limits. So I'd like to go around and give each of you a chance to maybe just give a one minute summary of a top line of, of you know, what call to action or what we can do um, from your perspective to really lift up climate justice now that is a top line that maybe is a reflection from what others have said or something you wanted to re-emphasize from your comments. But I, I wanted to also just uh, teeing off of Diana mentioned that uh, along with Madre, um, we can and other groups we do and others have formed a coalition of the Feminist Green New Deal here in the United States. And we can put that link into the chat because we are putting forward these values of what is feminist climate policy. And I think it's really good for us to share that analysis. Um, we don't have time for it, but we'll put that in the chat. But one of the main principles is that we have, there is no uh, domestic climate policy that is not global that the United States has an outsized role to play and therefore we need that responsibility. So I wanted to just highlight that and to uh, mention that we need in feminist climate policy, this understanding of this intersectionality of movements, but also the role of the US to do so much more given our historical um, uh, uh, participation in carbon emissions and colonialism and so much more. Um, so I wanted to mention that. And also for those of you who are just tuning in, uh, we had an entire session a few days ago on feminist economies. And I think that's really an important panel to tie into this one about really how are we approaching the economy in a very different way from indigenous perspectives to feminist perspectives to really understanding that there's many, many different ways that the economy must transform to really serve people and planet. And with that, let's go ahead first and hear from Monica, then India, then Alexandra, and then Diana. And again, just like a minute intervention. Thank you so much. Let's start with you, Monica. Yes, definitely is a conversation for, for a couple of days, but I definitely uh, just want to say thank you again for be, uh, allowing me to be here and speak and represent uh, so many communities that are being impacted. And I guess I would just leave folks with, you know, now is the time for bold and unapologetic grassroots leadership. You know, we are the experts and the investments need to be directed to those most impacted, you know, not later, but right now. So just knowing that our solutions include, uh, you know, the sacredness of Mother Earth and leave no one behind, that's what's needed right now. And it's a very critical moment. Thank you. 
Thank you for your good words, Monica, and your work. And uh, please, India. Yeah, a minute. Wow. Um, first of all, I would say that a, a, a proper feminist approach to climate justice is one that includes uh, non-binary and trans folks and that um, I think there can be a lot of work done within the gender space to, to broaden that and to open that door up um, to really make sure that everyone can be present and in the room and contributing um, and do so safely. Uh, and I think the second thing is um, really what Monica touched on, which was um, resourcing our people to do this work. Um, I'm in my first paid job ever doing this work. I um, started a few months ago, but I've been doing this work for about eight years now. Um, and the impact it's even had on my mental health has been amazing to be able to just really give myself to this stuff. So if, yeah, if we really believe in the solutions that frontline communities have been living for hundreds of thousands of years, um, then we also really need to be investing in that because the investment in the patriarchal colonial capitalist system has been trillions and trillions of dollars. So we need to start swinging some of that uh, resourcing in the other direction so that we can do this deep, good, amazing work. But like, as Monica said, like right now, um, we've only got a small window of time left. And uh, yeah, I look forward to one day meeting you guys on the front lines um, when we throw down in the streets and it will be a beautiful time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indy, and congratulations on getting resourced yourself and also uh, a call out to non-binary non organizing and inclusiveness and also to uh, the fact that we, we don't have a lot of time and let's resource the front lines and we will see you in the streets for sure and, and at the COP. And uh, now let's go ahead and hear from Alexandra and just a friendly reminder about interpretation. Alexandra, you have the floor. Do we still have Alexandra with us? Yes, we do. We're just trying to um, get unmuted. Thank you. Sí, aquí estoy. Sí, eh, pues agradecer por este espacio a, a todas las mujeres que han participado en este panel, a la que nos invitó. Pues muchísimas gracias. Ha sido un, una experiencia, pues, única para mí. También que sigamos trabajando juntos en la defensa de territorios, la defensa del cambio climático, eh, que, no, que esta no sea la primera vez, que sea más oportunidades como esta para hablar de nuestros territorios, de la, de la realidad que pasamos eh, en cada uno de nuestros territorios. Muchísimas gracias de antemano. Eh, espero volverla a saber vuelta como dice la compañera tal vez en las calles sí acá también salimos también a, protest a protestar a, a hacer eh, valer nuestros derechos muchísimas gracias muchas gracias Alexandra and uh, finally we'll give the last word to Diana well, my last word will have to be thank you to you all. And um, just really quickly, uh, the link that was shared and the mention that Osprey made about the feminist Green New Deal coalition, one of the places where we started was about uh, establishing what our values and principles were, which are spelled out on our website now, but were, which were the result of a really robust and collaborative process to come up with a, a, a depiction of what we stand for and who we are together and to be able to outreach to others and invite them to join us. So just to really reemphasize the need to start with, what do we stand for? What is our vision? What do we want to see in the world? And when we're doing the kind of cross movement outreach that I was talking about, it can really help to illuminate where harmful dynamics are emerging. You know, I mentioned before confronting militarism and this growing call to have a greener military and to be able to also understand that as a, as a false solution that we need to come together across movements to confront. So when we stand together in shared values, we're able to um, have, have stronger and more effective strategies to do that kind of work. And thank you once again. Thank you all. This is just an extraordinary conversation and uh, look forward to being in touch with all of you. And we wish you well in your work. We have been putting links to all of uh, your work in the chat and we'll continue to uplift um, all of your efforts and look forward to um, continuing to collaborate. Thank you very much and have a very good day. And with that, I want to welcome our next panel, which is um, 
the last panel of our six days, uh, we will have a closing session after the panel with uh, some beautiful uh, young women who are going to be talking to us and, and sharing some music with us. But in terms of formal panels, this is amazingly the, the last panel of a, a six day assembly that has been quite extraordinary because we, we really wanted to bring all of these different analyses and work um, as much as we could. Of course, there's many, many other leaders that could have been invited, but we really wanted to, to present a roadmap of what we're seeing and share as much of the landscape as we could for climate justice. And now I want to welcome this truly outstanding group of leaders who are presenting on this final panel, We Act for Climate Justice Now, part two. Uh, thank you all for your important work and leadership and taking time with us today in your, your busy lives. Um, and um, in many ways, these days have been um, a living prayer and a fierce call to action for our collective survival and well-being. And, and it's a call that's rippling out into the world. Uh, we have been on many different platforms, live streaming. Uh, the conversations have been super robust. Um, and uh, before we, we, I present um, and introduce the speakers, um, we felt that there was a need to one more time resurface um, you know, there's so many things we could talk about, but really honoring and lifting up women land defenders everywhere all over the world who are, um, you know, a part of a key part of the constellation of work at the policy level, um, at the community level, um, everything from regenerative economies and food sovereignty and security and all these different areas we're collectively working on. And also remember there are the land defenders who are literally putting their bodies on the line right there to protect the water, uh, to protect the land, to, to protect the forests. And so we wanted to take this time in the closing panel to start with a brief video to, to one more time lift up this frontline work of, of, of understanding that sometimes and for many, it often is literally at an embodied level. So with that, let's go ahead and see uh, this video. Thank you. Piraira Nerazi Ewa Tupã A conjuntura política brasileira é muito grave para toda a população, em especial para nós mulheres. E agora temos um presidente que, que acha que as mulheres têm que ser, têm papel secundário, salários menores. É, está aqui participando do Fórum Permanente da ONU, em frente à Embaixada do Brasil, para nós tem um significado muito forte. É porque é reafirmar a presença e a existência indígena em todos os espaços. Brazil is the deadliest country in the world for environmental defenders. Since the election of Bolsonaro, there has been an increase in the killings of indigenous peoples in Brazil. These are their lands, their forests that they have maintained. So it is up to all of us to be protecting indigenous rights. It's the morally correct thing to do to help our indigenous sisters and brothers when they're under attack, but also for all of us because of the climate. We need to protect the Amazon rainforest. Bolsonaro ainda the parliamentar. Ele falou que a cavalaria do Brasil era incompetente. Competente é a cavalaria norte-americana que conseguiu exterminar todos os indígenas. É muito urgente que o mundo escute a voz dos povos indígenas do Brasil. Nesse momento, o órgão institucional, políticas públicas, pouco importa. Porque o que está nesse momento em pauta é exatamente a destruição, o extermínio e, mais uma vez, o genocídio coletivo de nossos povos. Eu não sei o resultado da nossa mobilização. Pode ser que na próxima semana vocês tenham notícias 
de várias lideranças nossas presas, criminalizadas ou mortas. Porque esse é o momento que a gente está. Mas nós vamos seguir firmes, resistindo, pagando com a própria vida. Porque para nós, a luta pela Mãe Terra é a mãe de todas as lutas. É que são nossos territórios sagrados que garante o ar, a água, né, o clima e que garante a vida no planeta. Nós precisamos urgentemente romper com esse modelo de desenvolvimento que usa de forma predatória a Mãe Terra. Estamos aqui para reafirmar que a luta pela Mãe Terra é a mãe de todas as lutas. Nova York pode até ser o centro do mundo, mas o que garante a vida no planeta é a Amazônia. So, uh, sending good wishes to all of our relatives on the front line all over the world, protecting their lands and territories. Um, and so I welcome this really profound group of leaders to this uh, panel. We would love to hear from you about your work and how we can act for climate justice um, now um, and ongoing. And of course, we're getting for COP26 in Glasgow. We had mentioned earlier, in case you weren't here, that you know, we had made a statement about postponement of the COP because of the inequities around vaccines, the difficulties of indigenous peoples and global South partners even getting to the COP because of the lack of work that has been done properly by the COP presidency to allow there to be proper presentation, representation of those who are most impacted. Um, so we know there's a lot of challenges around this uh, COP. Nevertheless, it's going forward. So we're doing everything we can to ensure that there is representation of impacted communities. So we'd love to hear your comments about COP26, but certainly beyond COP26. This is an ongoing agenda for our survival, uh, for land, for respect for indigenous rights, for really pushing governments to not have false solutions, as well as lifting up community-led solutions and the important work all of you are doing. So it's a, it's a broad question about climate justice, so please respond in any way that you wish uh, to this moment and beyond. And I'll be introducing the speakers in the order that they are presenting. Um, it's very honored to have here with us Ariel Derringer. She is Athabasca Chippewan First Nations, the Executive Director of Indigenous Climate Action from Turtle Island or so-called Canada. Then we will be hearing from Josefina Skirk. She is Sami. She's an advocate for Sami rights and the former Vice President of the Sami Parliament in Sweden. Then we will be hearing from Jackie Patterson. She is the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project here in the United States. Then we will be hearing from Bukima Mucha Ahala. She is a decolonial and feminist political economist and political economist and policy analyst for Third World Network based in the US. And then we will be hearing from Thomisa Hussein. She is the permanent representative to the United Nations and the ambassador to the United States from the Maldives. And we will also then be hearing from Casey Camp Hornick, Ponca Nation. She is the environmental ambassador and board, uh, an environmental ambassador. And we're super honored to have her be a board member of We Can. Um, and she's also uh, an incredible leader and a mentor to me. Thank you so much for joining us. She is from Turtle Island or the US. And um, this is just, uh, um, just an amazing group of leaders that can guide us through this conversation. And with that, um, I would love to hand it over to my dear friend and colleague, Ariel. Ariel, you have the floor. Thank you. Masicho, thank you. Hi, hi. Iglanete, Denise Lutzlineta, Ariel Saekwe, Huche, Durange, Betsy, and E. Hesli. So, again, thank you so much. My name is Ariel Saekwe, Durange. My name is, is Dene. So, Ariel Saekwe means Thunder Woman in my language, which is Dene Sotlene or Dene. 
and I am from the Treaty 8 territory of Northern Alberta in so-called Canada. And our people's traditional name uh, is Kaitale Denesotlani. And I think that this is really important to understand in the context of grounding us in this conversation around climate justice. Because for my people, the Kaitale or the Kaitale Dene Sotlane, Kaitale means people of the willow. Dene Sotlane means people of the land. And when you break down the word Dene, even the word Dene that represents our people, it means to flow from the earth. We have a deep and immense relationship with the pl places where we come from. We are intrinsically connected to the natural world. We are one and the same. I am the willow and the willow is me. If you destroy the Delta, then who are we as a people? And this land is more than just a place. It is where I was nourished and nurtured as a child. It spoke to me through the wind, through the babbling brooks, the rivers and streams, the forests, the medicines we picked, the animals we tracked, hunted, fished, and harvested, and through the stories of our ancestors. Many of the stories were delivered from the land, not from other humans, from the air, from the earth, and from all of our relatives. We are all related is a phrase that's often spoken by our people. And it's not limited to our human relatives, but includes the winged ones, the four-legged ones, the ones that swim, and every living organism to the air we breathe, the rocks, the mountains, the moon, and the stars, all things are related. And the in indigenous knowledge systems that our, com our communities house are incredibly and intrinsically important to addressing the climate crisis that we are in. These systems are the drivers of our communities and our knowledge is passed down through experiential learning and storytelling. And it helps us to bind our collective knowledge and experiences of all of our relations together to build systems of governance, language, educational systems, and the ways in which we relate to the land. This is an important context when we start to talk about climate justice as a framework. Because currently, the, the, at the UN level, the states are coming together for the COP26 to talk about ways in which we can mitigate and address and adapt to climate change from a colonial perspective. It does not include a justice framework. A climate justice framework does not reduce the climate crisis to a puzzle simply focused on counting a carbon. Instead, it's grassroots, it's community-led movements from around the world that are looking beyond the economy. They are looking at the exploitation of land, labor, and living systems, at the erosion of seed, soil, story, and spirit, and they seek to uplift real solutions around us every day, from the indigenous knowledge systems, food sovereignty, decommodification of land, healthcare, and housing, to abolishing the military industrial complex, seeking to extract, extract the ledge, last dredges of fossil fuels from this land. We have to think about ways in which we center community organizing, direct action, community-based decision-making by those on the front lines of the crisis who are also at the front lines of climate change and the front lines of change. In essence, people whose efforts are guided by shared principles and a common vision of restoring all of our relations with the earth and with each other and embracing relationships that cultivate a decolonized worldview of respect, reciprocity, mutuality and solidarity across all communities with the rest of the living world and Mother Earth need to be guiding the solutions, not those that are simply looking at the climate crisis from an economic perspective that needs to be uh, commodified and valued, that continues to devalue and invisibilize the voices that have been guiding and protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity. We also have to recognize that colonization is not something that happened. It is an ongoing process that continues to uh, attack our, our communities. And uh, it continues to shape the structures and relationships between settlers and indigenous peoples. Systemic racism is real. And true change happens when we address the root causes, climate colonization, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, Indigenous Climate Action as an organization invests in actively dismantling this by empowering our communities to work towards decolonization and recognizing that we are our own experts. We don't have to translate ourselves all the time through the lens of our oppressors. 
we have to push back against these structures and advocate for those systems that have existed in our communities for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We have to look at challenging those structures of white colonial settler society and look to advance the systems of our own communities. I say this as someone who comes from a community that's been impacted, deeply impacted by the largest industrial project on planet Earth, the Alberta tar sands. This project has destroyed our waterways, our air systems, our food systems. It is contributing vastly to massive amounts of emissions into the atmosphere, which is exacerbating the impacts of climate change, which are disrupting the flows of our river systems, the weather patterns and the migratory patterns of many of our species that are our keystone species and our food and subsistence. And we have seen how this has impacted not just our human health from the cancers and autoimmune diseases that our communities have had through the contamination, but all through, through the degradation of our spirits, through the degradations of who we are as Indigenous peoples, as they erode and destroy the Kaitale or the Athabasca Delta, the Willow, they are eroding and destroying the spirits of our communities. But we are standing up and we are standing back. Our community is advancing our language with matriarchal women coming to the forefront guiding our language revitalization programs to land users, to restoring our traditional food practices, to advancing our local economies of trade and food sovereignty and security, to advancing the ways that our culture is driving our community and pulling us away from the colonial systems that have pushed us into capitalist systems that have put us into a place of economic hostages of deciding what goes on the table or putting food on the table, a roof over our head, or participating or saving our culture because they say you can only be employed in this industry because this is where the money is. But we have to step back against these things because these industries are not just destroying our lands and territories, but they are really, really impacting deeply the women in our community. And it's that this is why the women are standing up because we see it first and foremost in our communities from our children being sick, but also from the from the imposition of massive amounts of foreign workers that come into our territory. When I say foreign, I don't mean from other countries. I mean foreign, foreigners, settlers that come to our territory with no relation, no understanding of our lands and territories. And they come in with these workers and we see an increase of sex trafficking. We see an increase of domestic violence and sexual violence against women. We see an increase of alcohol and drugs into our communities and a complete disruption of our systems. And it's our women that are standing up. It's our women that continue to advocate for our communities. And we must be move, moving towards a climate justice framework that addresses those root causes from, again, colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy. We must undo these structures and systems and make room for more. We must advance those people that have been driving these solutions since time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have been advocating and advancing the protection of our territories for generations. Thank you, Masicho. Thank you so much, Ariel, for the incredible analysis that you have presented and also the work of Indigenous Climate Action. And uh, I just wanted to note that uh, over the last weeks, Ariel has been guiding some very powerful uh, online um, events to specifically uh, prepare Indigenous peoples for their approach to this upcoming COP and beyond. It's a much deeper analysis, but it's been really, really helpful. So I just wanted to give a shout out for that beautiful work you've been doing and uh, um, um, really let people know about that as an educational resource. And with that, I'm really honored to bring another dear colleague on to the conversation with us. Josefina, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, Ariad. It was uh, a wonderful uh, talk that you did. I feel deeply inspired. Um, and I, I feel a recognition in so much of what I uh, was thinking about, what I wanted to say when I um, uh, was asked to do this, to participate in this conversation uh, with all of you other amazing women. Um, I. It's the favorite time of year for me, the fall time. And it's not because I don't like flowers or that I like the cold and the winter months that are coming. Well, I do, but it's uh, because it's hunting season, smooth hunting season. 
And again, it's not because of bloodthirst, but uh, it's the time of year when I get to join my elders and we go out on the land and we uh, move in areas where we rarely otherwise do nowadays, sadly. Um, and I get to listen to all of the stories. Since I'm not at the forefront of actually wanting to shoot the moose, I usually carry the bags for the older men. <laughs> so I get to go walk by alongside them. And, and all of these stories, they would never come up with and remember at other times of the year. They come when we're out there, the names, uh, people that moved in the area before I can, uh, I can, uh, what's the word for it? Um, well, uh, it, so many personal details about people that were, had passed already before I was born. That's what kind of comes in remembrance to them when, when we move there and stories, spirituality, and so, so much more things that make up the, my core identity, the, the realization that, okay, the Sami language, our language wasn't written until very recently. Instead, all of the stories were kept through places on the ground. When you pass that creek, you remember this story. When you pass that rock, you remember that. And that it's, it's, it's a giant library. And that's the library that we're trying to protect. And that I dream of being uh, a 90 year old person who can give to coming generations. Um, but I see that that's really on the line right now for several reasons. One of them is climate change, that the knowledge is becoming less and less relevant. Uh, things that we know about the ice, that it's usually our highway during winter season that we can uh, move across and almost live on, um, uh, is, is becoming less re relevant because, uh, and it's it making life much more dangerous. Uh, up in the Arctic where we live, <laughs> things are changing really fast. But the second part of it is that Sweden is saying that, well, the Sami people need to carry their load too when we're now trying to mitigate climate change. So we're going to, to do this green shift and we're going to do it by building huge industrial windmill parks all over Sami territory because no rich people when living in the coastal cities uh, the majority society people, they don't want them around their expensive houses. But up in the mountains and in the forest area where the Samis are, uh, the people with less uh, influence and power in society, that's a great place to put them. So we're carrying the load of Sweden's green shift. Um, and we're also living under uh, other ideas of a sustainable future, which might be things like green uh, steel. So we're already exporting 98% of Europe's total iron ore production from Sami lands. Zero is going back to the Sami people. It's the huge state-owned mine. They take everything down to Stockholm. Um, and we see nothing of it as super poor areas. Um, and they're going to now do that in some kind of green way. Anyhow, so they need to build any even more in milk parks. But what I wanted to say <laughs> is that what I think we need to do is one, things like this, which is collaborations, working together, doing something that has an element of surprise, which is the kind of global connection with indigenous peoples from different uh, areas, but also organizations that might produce something that is newsworthy and we need to change the public opinion, but also that can contribute to ourselves in maybe surprising ways and things we didn't expect. Um, and do this from different perspectives, connect politics with activism, cultural artists, um, and of course the traditional uh, knowledge holders. Um, we need to really look into ourselves and our communities and see which conflicts are we willing to leave behind, both internally. I think colonization has done so much harm in fragmentation. We have divided ourselves up. I don't know if it's true for other indigenous groups, but I've seen this all over Sápmia and all over our people is that we are so divided because of idiotic 
uh, Swedish Norwegian state uh, laws and uh, colonial practices. Um, it is difficult, but we really have nothing to do but to move from it because we are we are on the losing end right now. And I am so inspired by other indigenous peoples that I'm seeing doing these healing processes within their people. I think it's super inspiring, very important. It's something that we need to bring into our own people and kind of work through to find more unity. And I also think that it is so, so, so important to constantly remind us to keep, keep our own resilience on is to not forget to live our traditional lives when we're trying to defend it. It's so easy to get so tied up in defending the land that you never get to have those walks with the elders, for example, that you never maybe as an elder had get to get the time to tr transfer your knowledge to the younger generation. <laughs> and then what? do we have left as an indigenous people if not actually being able to live in the culture? Uh, I think what I did um, and what I am working to provide a possibility for more people to do is move back home, live closer um, to my traditional lands and my elders and learn as much as possible. Um, maybe that's more valuable sometimes than being at the UN arena. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very, very much, uh, Josefina, for your really um, strong comments. And it's always an honor to, to have time with you. And, and thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to say a few couple of things. Um, because of, of your really good comments about you know, needing our own spaces, as you said, uh, with indigenous peoples to, to live out your traditional ways um, and, and not always be in the fight. And we've been talking over the course of the week about uh, having spaces of struggle, which we need to be in and fight, and whether it's at the UN or in our own communities and our own governments and whether it's on the front lines putting our bodies out there getting arrested you know these spaces of struggle to protect what we love and hold dear but also having spaces for healing and spaces for learning and spaces for practicing our our values and ways of life and that we need that balance of these different spaces and not just to be in one or the other you know being the healer and the warrioress and and um that need that we all have to, to be on the front lines in spaces of struggle, but also spaces of healing and, and living well. So thank you really for, for spotlighting that. And also to, to let you know that we did have uh, on a, one of our first panels, a, a calling out of no greenwashing and false solutions and really highlighted the incredible victory in Sami lands in Sweden of fighting off this horrible Harvard practice of geoengineering in your community without your consent was absolutely insane. And how, you know, excited and proud we are that, uh, you know, the Sami in Sweden were able to, to stop that horrific, quote unquote, experiment in your territories without consent and no to false solutions and no to, to doing these things without consent. And then lastly, um, you had mentioned about, um, you know, how, how we can influence some of these spaces. And um, in case you did not know, we have through this assembly, a call to action that has been delivered during the UN General Assembly um, for directly, we reached every government. We got a, a connection to every government liaison and to financial institutions around the world to lay out the agenda that is being discussed in this assembly. So we can put forward our own ideas, not in their spaces. So anyways, just thank you for your beautiful comments and highlighting these points. And I now hand the floor over to my dear friend and colleague, Jackie. Thank you so much. It's an honor as always to be with you all. And um, yeah, so I, and it's an honor to follow the, the uh, predecessors on the, on the panel and just hearing those, those stories, reflections, analysis and call to action. Um, 
Yeah, I, I th it's, it's the comments that I wanted to bring really kind of center around what some of my colleagues in the EJ, in the environmental justice movement are calling the syndemic that we're in the middle of, um, which is they're, they're calling it a syndemic because it's a convergence of, of multiple pandemics and epidemics um, from, of course, COVID-19, the climate crisis, the economic crisis, eco economic collapse that we're really facing, and the, um, and the racial awakening that we're experiencing here in the U.S. and, and beyond. Um, on March 9th of, of last year, I was on a mini vacation and I was watching the news about what was happening with COVID-19. And at that time, in, it was just kind of largely the quote unquote outbreak here in the US was in that kind of that Kirkland um, uh, nursing home in Washington state. And but they but they saw the writing was on the wall in terms of of, of, a, of a, a large pandemic, and so I sat and what, spent 19 hours putting together this um, this document called the equity 10 equity implications of the COVID 19 pandemic, and and all of that came came to fruition all of the equity implications that i laid out there and more and it wasn't because i had had a prophecy or it wasn't because i'm an oracle or anything like that anybody on the front lines of these injustices would have been able to do the same thing because these these crises these 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 acute or slow moving crises all have very similar systemic underpinnings and therefore the patterns of inequities in terms of how they roll out and who's on the front lines of the greatest impact is predictable, is sadly predictable, because it is all based on, on, and particularly in the United States, but also globally to some extent, but what one of my um, previous panelists spoke, spoke about in terms of the white settler um, and the white settler practices and principles and really the, the the founding of what's now called the United States, Turtle Island, is is really this foundation of an extractive, of an exploitive economy that has lived, persisted to this day. And so we know that that the, the contrary to the romanticization of, of people seeking freedom and so forth, although yes, they might have been seeking freedom, but it was for them, it was an inverse relationship between their freedom and well-being and the freedom and well-being of the people that they murdered and displaced to, to establish these United States. And we also know that then they went over in ships to Sub-Saharan Africa and loaded people into the bottom of ships as 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 chattel, you know, as property, as inanimate property to be enslaved and become who built this nation. And so that that notion of of again an inverse relationship. In order for me to be well, in order for me to have the wealth and power that I want, it is at the expense and at the subjugation of other people as well as of the planet itself. And that persists to today, and it's gotten more sophisticated in some ways, but it's still the same basis for our policies and practices. And so we see that the earth and our communities are crying for justice, whether it's what we've seen in terms of the natural, the unnatural disasters that, that proliferate, and we see how it plays out in communities. We have a community like Sam Branch, Texas, that has never had running water since emancipation. Again, people who founded that community were people who were the, the, the enslaved labor that built so much of the infrastructure of this country. And with what little they were able to scrap together, they founded that community in the 1800s after being unshackled from, 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 um, from slavery. And now their ancestors, they, they had, they, they, you know, they built, built that with a dream that their ancestors would do their, their, their successors would do better than, than, than they were, they were seeing themselves as laying the groundwork for what would happen with their successors or their, you know, 
their progeny. And yet here, you know, decades later, century, a couple of centuries later, people are in the original structures and they don't even have running water in that community. And, and yet at the same time, we have practices where people are being displaced from, from, um, from those communities because they are, people are prospecting for that land and therefore trying to drive people out of the land by denying them water, denying them trash, trash pickup and so forth. And, and, and denying them the build, ability to even do improvements on their homes. So whether it's Sand Branch, Chicago, where, you know, again, the um, war on drugs has really resulted in a war on our communities. And we have these situations where, where, where gangs and so forth are, are proliferating and people can't even, a child can't even walk down the street safely. That's where I was born and raised. And I remember that. And I see that that continues to proliferate places like San Bernardino, California to, um, to Baytown, Texas, where communities aren't able to, I just was showing a video about a community, about Baytown, Texas, and in the video, all the, the kids who had created this video were wearing masks, but that video was made in 2016. <laughs> and so at that time, the, you know, the world was not safe for us to breathe, the water was not safe for us to drink, the surface, they were wearing masks and gloves, the surfaces weren't safe for us to touch even then. And now it's not like the, the COVID-19 is a great equalizer, because now, yes, it's brought us in the same place in terms of being mass but now now in, instead of just being mass we're actually actively dying and so these are some of the the challenges that we talk about and what and with this what this moment demands of us is not is it, there's a song back in the day called ain't no half stepping and so as we talked about the the false solutions uh, we were just on a um, webinar for the hoodwinked in the hot house we really, really laid out some of these false solutions so whether we're market-based solutions or the techno fixes we can't we have to have the zero tolerance for these types of things that will just slow us down when we need to be surging ahead with, with major systems change. We need to shift the narrative away from this scarcity mentality that, that, that proliferates this notion of an inverse relationship between one's well-being and someone else's well-being to recognizing the abundance of this earth. We have to go move away from the finite resources of the fossil fuel economy to the regenerative resources and, and practices of our earth. So I want to wrap up because I know our time and I want to respect time, but one of the last two things I will say is that we have to make sure that we, as we, we treasure the, the, the leadership and the anchoring of movements of families, of communities, of women, because we know that now we have this all, uh, we're often being lectured to, to engage in self-care. So the same person who's lecturing me about engaging in self-care is adding another brick to the basket on my back. <laughs> and so we have to really engage in community care for the treasure that women, women are in anchoring this movement. We have to institutionalize community care, movement care of each other. So I will pass it back to Osprey and our next speaker. Thank you so much. Oh, Jackie, thank you so much. And it's really great to see you um, and for your really powerful comments. And um, I don't know, I think you could be an oracle. Um, you're pretty brilliant. I, I don't know, I wouldn't leave that out of the picture. Um, and we have dropped Jackie's really important report. I remember talking to you when you were, you're putting that together, just ferociously working hard. So we've dropped that very important uh, report into the chat for you. And thank you for pointing out, you know, these root causes of white supremacy and this, this, you know, foundation of expendable people and sacrificed people. And that this, this practice is so atrocious and egregious of human rights violations and uh, racism that has got to stop. We're not going anywhere without stopping this idea of sacrifice people, sacrifice zones, and sacrifice zip codes. And earlier on an earlier panel, we had Sharon Levine and, and others um, uh, to really talk about both the gendered and racial impacts of the fossil fuel industry as one extractive industry and, and the incredible harms that go unrecognized, untalked about. It's just so outrageous. The, the level of cancer rates and harms to women and their bodies um, and babies um, it, it, it's just, we need to keep talking about it, we need to surface it, and we need to end it. So I really appreciate you, you bringing that up. Um, and we have also dropped a uh, hoodwink in the hot house, um, that report into the chat, and also referencing back, Jackie was on a really powerful panel 
I guess a week or so ago uh, to also continue to talk about false solutions, which we must never stop talking about. So I know that we're repeating these things, but my goodness, the airtime we have to talk about this is so small compared to false solutions. Like we're just going to keep saying it till it starts becoming the discourse. So uh, thank you very much. And with that, I would like to hand over the floor to our colleague, Omika. Omika, you have the floor, thank you. Hi, hello, I am so honored to be here. And I just wanted to state that I am actually in a car and I hope the sound and the video goes okay. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Here, I have been working with the Global South uh, Feminist Justice and Climate Justice Movements, including the Feminist Green and Decolonial Global Green New Deal look like, with the priority and the lens being on Global South countries and addressing the enormous divides uh, born out of several centuries of colonialism, which are being exacerbated and reproduced, in fact, systematically reproduced in COVID. So I begin by uh, at least uh, starting that, you know, I am coming from the regions of India and Indonesia. I grew up in Indonesia, which was essentially the playground of US economic imperialism through the 1970s and 80s and uh, even now. So I come from that lens of having lived and seen places where economic imperialism is very much alive and in fact, even more sophisticated and even more dangerous. I begin with stating that a feminist and decolonial global Green New Deal resists the socially constructed hierarchies of racial, gender, class, caste, sexuality, and ability inequalities, which underpin colonial, neoliberal, and capitalist structures. A decolonial and global Green New Deal recognizes that the ecological collapse we are experiencing in climate change is a direct result of an unequal social contract shaped by centuries of colonialism. A decolonial position means that we cannot deny that we live in a world where black, brown, feminine, queer, and working class people endure acts of dehumanization on a normalized basis. On a daily, a feminist and decolonial global Green New Deal creates a new global economy paradigm that forges active links between climate change racialized and gendered labor exploitation and the trade rules and economic structures that reproduce inequalities both within and among nations. Why does the Green New Deal have to be global? All the talk of a US and European Green New Deal. Why are we pushing for a global vision of a Green New Deal grounded in global justice? It is because no country or region exists in isolation. It is because climate change means colonial justice, racial justice, and economic justice. And it is because centering an internationalist global justice frame to the Green New Deal is indispensable to a world that is ecologically, economically, and socially just. The 70% of humanity that lives across the global south. Currently, none of the Green New Deals, whether it's from Korea, the United States, the European Union, Australia, none of them address a global climate justice lens, a global economic justice lens. We also say that a global Green New Deal has to be feminist in that it centers the care economy as the invaluable work of the for children, older adults, the disabled, the physically and mentally ill. And as we see, it took a global health pandemic in COVID for the world to acknowledge how the chronic underinvestment and lack of infrastructure in the care economy is an urgent crisis that stems from the sexual division of labor. The economists have calculated that the monetary value of the global care economy is over 13 trillion US dollars. Incidentally, this is about the same amount that the top billionaires in the world have profited in just the last 18 months of the pandemic. So scaled up long-term and consistent public investments in the care economy is incredibly vital to also connecting to the divestment from the fossil fuel economy that is necessary. And this is where US economic and military imperialism comes straight into view. The imperative to divest from fossil fuels is highlighted by recent findings that rich country private banks 
loan 2.7 trillion to fossil fuel companies. Let's just give it a minute and see. Paris Climate Agreement. And we see that the US military countries. So is directly, um, you know, the, the, the blunt of effects across the global south from severe droughts to devastating typhoons and economic repercussions. Um, I also want to highlight that um, a global green new deal also in human rights and women's rights frameworks, discrimination and as well as the um, Beijing platform. All of these are incredibly important for a global and uh, decolonial Green New Deal. I want to conclude with three key channels for the kind of system change we need in the global design of finance and trade. We need to enable technology transfer for climate change related technologies for the global south through trade rules. The way that intellectual property rights uh, constrain and really make it possible for developing countries to access environmental technologies needs to be addressed. We need to address debt justice because today developing countries spend far more on repaying their international creditors than they do on their health, their education, much less their climate sectors. So we need debt justice in manifold forms to address illegal debt odious debt, moral debt, climate debt, colonial historical debt. And here we call for climate reparations from developed countries to compensate for emitting the vast majority of historical carbon emissions from the advent of industrialization in the 1820s. Um, we also call for the proactive replenishment of the Green Climate Fund and for developed countries to honor their fair, share, fair shares. Another key important thing to conclude with is that it's really about addressing a way of life. It's about consumption, not just production. It's about carbon footprint. Bush Sr. famously stated during the Kyoto Protocol meetings that the American way of life is not up for sale, uh, not up for negotiation. Well, now we need to say for global climate justice or a decolonial future that the American way of life is indeed up for negotiation. And this refers to such a disparity where the average American is responsible for 15 metric tons of carbon emissions, whereas people in Brazil and India, two or one metric ton. So to meaningfully reduce the carbon footprint, it is an entire way of life that has to be altered. This means not just reducing energy consumption, expanding plant-based diets, but it's also about a massive shift to a more um, a systemic change in, in the way that uh, big business produces and sells the, 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 the consumption economy. Ultimately, we need a transformative decolonial turn toward asserting a humanity where colonial hierarchies of race, caste, class, and patriarchal supremacy are dismantled, where reparations are enacted through legal and policy changes, and interdependent ways of living in unity with nature, with ourselves and within ourselves, arise to form a new green and equal decolonial reality. Thank you very much, Bumika, for your uh, really important intervention. And Bumika, you really bring up some really critical points about you know, what is justice and accountability in this moment? And also to uh, really understand, um, you know, the different uh, values and worldview that we now need to clearly bring to the surface to achieve climate justice. So thank you very much for that. And uh, when we bring you back on, it seems to do better when we just see you visually and just hear you verbally, just so you know. But we heard, we heard you and we thank you very much for your intervention, which was very, very important. And now I would like to hand the floor to Filmisa Hussein, um, the permanent representative of the United Nations and ambassador to the United States from Maldives. Good day to you all. It is a true pleasure to be able to join the Women's Assembly for Climate Justice alongside such inspiring visionary and fearless leaders and advocates from 
around the world. It is deeply personal for me to be here today because I've been a part of Weekend for the past decade and I've been able to experience and witness firsthand the amazing work Women's Earth Climate Action Network does. I want to thank Weekend, led by my dear friend Osprey, for convening this assembly and for continued efforts to build a more equitable and a sustainable world. This assembly is happening at an important time as we face a number of interconnected threats from the COVID pandemic to climate change and rampant environmental destruction. Our work to confront these challenges must be equitable and must protect both the rights of people and nature. At home, all Maldivians, particularly women, are dealing with the impacts of climate change. From the woman who makes a living growing crops, which are now more frequently destroyed by severe storms, to the family that runs a guest house who has to spend more every year to place sandbags on the shore for protection against encroaching waves. The climate emergency presents a very real threat to all of us and our way of life. Women are not just bearing the brunt, but women are also leading advocates for climate justice in the Maldives, just as around the world. From civil society to our government, where half of our foreign services ambassadors, the president's envoy on climate change and the environment minister are all women. So what exactly are we demanding be done? Over 20 years ago, when small islands, including Maldives, first started advocacy for 1.5 degrees, we had a realistic chance to achieve it. And as we sit here today, the IPCC tells us we are already at 1.2 degrees of warming. Time is slipping away and our futures are at stake. We know we have the technology and the tools to reduce emissions. We know that it can be done. The scientists are saying it can be done. We also know the days of fossil fuels are numbered. We know we will get to net zero emissions at some point. But the question is, will we do it in time to save the small islands like the Maldives? Are we mobilizing our efforts at the speed and magnitude we need to ensure our children and grandchildren can enjoy our magnificent and beautiful islands? Are we mobilizing our efforts in a manner in which we can ensure children can grow up on the same white sandy beaches and rich and unforgettable Tokers blue lagoons? I don't believe so. Unfortunately, this is the sad truth of our current reality. So wh what do we need? What we need is political will. We need political will. We need real commitments to action, not just words. The people are demanding it. Small islands are demanding it. We are demanding it. And we need this from bigger economies, from both developed and developing countries. The world demands this of us. We must ensure millions of children from small islands and around the world will have a home to grow up in. Today's youth are demanding a refreshed, fairer, greener world in the post-COVID era. We owe them that. Friends, in the face of these challenges, often the situation can seem bleak. This year's President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Abdullah Shahid of the Maldives, has set hope as the theme of the work we do at the United Nations for the session. As he often says, as a Maldivian, it is in our very ethos to persevere, to hope and to work for a better tomorrow. We are hopeful and will work to ensure that our children and grandchildren can continue to live and prosper on our islands. We are hopeful because organizations like we can are mobilizing the types of action we need. I commit to continue to work and push in the multilateral arena to advance our goals. Know that our strength comes from our solidarity. Events like today reaffirm how broad and deep our commitment is to this cause. So let us keep up the fight and the hard work and be alongside each other every step of the way. I thank you.
Thank you so much, Phil, for your comments. And uh, we had a conversation a little bit uh, earlier, I think it was yesterday, Jay Begay was on one of the calls with us, um, who's a very powerful leader um, from uh, Seque Pueblo, leader um, in New Mexico. And we were talking about inside and outside strategies and those relationships. And so um, I really am honored to have Phil with us because um, you know, I met her through, you know, a lot of um, feminist organizing around climate justice as an activist. And then she moved on to now being uh, the UN ambassador for uh, the Maldives. And um, I, I know that she's pushing from the inside really hard. And I just want to encourage us to, to of course, uh, do all the work we do from the fields to the streets, um, the advocacy work, and to also realize uh, more uh, women and feminist and gender diverse relatives are entering into political spaces. And I really want to encourage that because not only do we need to push governments, we need to take them over. And so let, let's keep looking at those inside and outside strategies. And with that, I'm very, very honored to bring uh, Casey Kemp Hornick into the conversation. Thank you very, very much, Casey, for joining us. Wibnaha, Zatia, Osprey, Ariel, Jackie, all of the others that are here today, and all of you hundred and other women who are joining us. I'm going to ask at this moment that you lend me your spirit and I'll lend you mine so that we can come together in a, in a way that makes uh, us even more powerful than we already are. It's an honor to be among you matriarchs and future matriarchs. As we were listening to my young relative, Ariel, I heard the thunders going across the skies here. And I know they're relative to all. And I'm hoping that for all these wise words that have been shown, for all these strong spirits who have been heard, for all the gathering of the prayers and the, the uncertainties of our daily lives, that we take this moment also to be listening. And I don't mean just listening to each other because we are inspiring each other. We are giving each other permission to feel the strength as women that we should feel every second, every moment from the time we're born until we transition into the next world. But we need to listen, in my estimation, the way that I was taught to all of creation right now. I was listening to Ariel and some of the others speaking about their homelands and the devastation that goes on there. And thinking about this day that we're wearing orange at the same time remembering the stories of my own mother when I listened to Josefina talking about listening to the elders. My mother was born in 1914 of the first generation born in captivity here in, in our homeland. They call the United States, they call America. She was born in this land called Nebraska or now called Nebraska. It was between Nishude and near Brara, the smoking waters called the Missouri, near Brara, the swift running waters, Nibalava. And in those lands, things were right. In her father and mother's childhood, things were good. The corn knew where to grow. The winds knew when to blow. The storms came at the time our people could listen and know they were coming. The buffalo had their ways, and so did all of the other relatives that lived among them, the deer, the turtles. It reminds me of a dream my mother shared with me, another story. The fish, we knew when was the time to share our lives with them. Those things that grew, the berries, we knew that. That was only two generations ago. Two generations ago. 
when the first contact of those ones came sweeping through Panka and began to create a situation that was untenable, killing the buffalo in mass slaughters, removing us from the territory that loved us as we loved her, and putting us in these these places they called reservations as prisoner of war camps. That's where my mother was born in 1914, a mere 25 years after the forced removal that her father was on as a child of five. And yet we're here today. And yet we're dealing with the same oppression and the same mindset as came sweeping across our homelands of Nebraska. And yet we're dealing with them with the same indigenous knowledge that we had then. Because it lives within ourselves. It lives within our minds and our spirits. And that's why people like my girl here, like Ariel, like you, Josefina, Osprey, and Catherine, all of you, that I don't know your names. That's why you're gathered here today, because those knowledges live within your spirit as well. Because deep within your cellular makeup, deep within the spirit that is connected to the spirit nation, we're receiving the guidance that we need to be able to make our way through here. It may be coming to you in the forms of the written word. It may be coming to you in this voice that we're sharing right now. It may be coming to you in the winds that whirl when the tornadoes and the hurricanes come during this purification of our mother earth. She's in a sacred moment right now. She's in that moment, that transitional moment like if you've given birth to a child we we're speaking about this just earlier being mothers grandmothers great grandmothers there's a transitional moment when your body no longer is in your control when that child is pushing through you and all of a sudden the bearing down comes and you give yourself over to something greater than yourself and that child comes forth and a new life is born. A new spirit comes. That spirit is what our Mother Earth is doing right now. These contractions that we're feeling, this time of unrest that we're feeling, this feeling of knowing that things are going to change and that we're part of it, is part of being woman. The Moon Mother, is working with those rhythms right now with the mother ocean, working with the rhythms of the woman. So reclaiming these spaces in whatever form that we're doing these things, and they come in many forms, are all part of this natural process that's going to be. Our mother earth, she will endure. Our mother earth, she will endure. Our indigenous teachings, our indigenous wisdoms, help us to set aside our minds and put them over there. They, that wisdom's gonna come anyway. It may come in a form of, of writing a political statement. It may come in the form of the guidance that we feel inside, you know. In a few weeks, many of us are gonna be in Washington, DC. We're gonna be in the streets. We're going to let those colonial fools arrest us so that we could say, it's time to declare a climate emergency. It's time for you to open your eyes, open your ears, close your mouth, and do something. No more false solutions. No more nonsense coming from the patriarchal society that forgets its place. What needs to happen now is to listen to your mama. Listen to your mother earth. Listen to the guidance within the, the female body, the female mind, the female spirit. That is a natural balance. That is a universal balance. My mother, the earth. My father, the sky. 
they love one another. They know how to purify this earth. They know that if we as human beings come back into a way of listening to all that is, instead of feeling as if we're in some kind of great ability to handle it all and do it all, then, then we're going to we're gonna mess up here. But if we set our egos aside, as you all are doing, and we come together as we are doing today, we got this with great respect to all of you. Sean, we the huh. Hmm. Thank you so much, Casey, for your incredible wisdom and words and energy that you share with us and all your guidance and example for us. Um, it's so deeply appreciated. Thank you for moving us very deeply um, with those really powerful statements. Thank you very, very much. Um, what I'd like to do uh, in, in the time that we have, and again, I wish we were all sitting around a table together um, in person and sharing a meal and friendship and strategizing and conjuring more of our power together. But I am glad that we have this space and, and look forward to seeing you all soon in, in places together, both of, of struggle and of healing. And I would like to go back to each of you uh, just to take, we have like two minutes each for a closing remark, maybe something you want to add to what you um, already stated or comment um, on something another presenter had said, uh, but to send us off with your, your message to the world. We do have uh, thousands of people listening in on the live streams on different platforms, um, and, and this will be continued to be shared out. So uh, if we could hear first from Ariel, then Josefina, then Jackie, then Bumika, and then come back to Casey with just a couple of minutes that we have for each of you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Ariel, the floor is yours. Messi Cho, thank you so much. Thank you, Casey and Josephine and Jackie and um, Bu Bu Bumika? Bumika. 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 And all of the wonderful speakers that have been a part of this panel so far. I think that we are in a time of tremendous shift right now. I think that cannot be understated. While the planet and the climate is shifting, so are we as a people. Today is a day of truth and reconciliation here in Canada. I'm wearing my orange shirt. Um, I, my, the touches of that and the reaches of that are very, very close and near to dear to me. My father is a survivor of residential schools, but he's also a survival, survivor of uh, experimental tuberculosis hospitals where they experimented on children, medical experiments on children for five years before he was placed in a residential school. There is this misconception that colonization and these things happened so long ago, but I am the first generation in my family to not experience these deeply atrocious and historical abuses at the hands of colonizers. Many of these people are still alive that, that inflicted this abuse on our people. Many of these people are still in positions of power and we must not under, under, um, undermine that. We must not underplay that. We have to accept the fact that we are still pulling ourselves out of these systems of colonization. And we have to listen to those that know these experiences firsthand, that have the wisdom and the knowledge to guide us forward in a way that will open up and expand our consciousness beyond the things that we have lived within for so long. There's an elder that once said, and I'm gonna leave you with this, that we have two ears and one mouth for a reason because we need to listen twice as much as we speak. And that refers to the fact that we have forgotten how to listen to the earth. We have forgotten how to listen to the streams and the animals and the trees and the plants and the medicines. We have forgotten how to listen with both of our ears. We speak so much with our mouths, but it's time that we start listening so that we can reconnect with those those languages, those laws, and those governance that can take us back to balancing the sacred. Masicho, hi, hi. Thank you very much, Ariel. What a, a good reminder 
of of keeping our ears open and and doing more listening that's that's such a powerful uh, statement thank you for that um josephina you have the floor um and again you know don't be rushed just just sort of i don't want to rush people either just say what you need to say thank you thank you i think there's been so many good points given here um I'd just like to share with you that Sweden is now moving very close to establishing a truth commission on how it's been treating the Sami people historically. And I think that is an important step also when it comes to climate justice, if it's a proper mandate for the truth commission. And I think it needs to be done. I mean, what was done in Canada is, is so important, <laughs> but it needs to be very much more. And especially if we want something that can lead to reconciliation true reconciliation and not just paper products and people crying on camera and then approving pipelines. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to share that with you and I would also like to ask for, for support from the international community and other indigenous peoples because we need to push Sweden and the other states that have colonized our territory and I would also want to encourage others to contact me. I would love to give the support that I can and that I can uh, transfer through the Sami parliament and try to raise uh, uh, others to do as well. Um, so I wanted to, to end there. I think it's um, just so many other great people that should have those minutes. Thank you. Well, you're very deserving of those minutes. And is there a link uh, to how we can support you? We've been putting links to uh, the things that you have told us about and to you, but um, you know, you can think about it. If there's some way you're asking for support from the international community for mm -hmm. a push in your government, and we would like to support you. Maybe uh, if you don't have a direct link now, you can share it with us later, and we will be sure to get that out through our newsletter and social media channels. But you know, this is this is all very real and happening now, and so you know, any of these calls to action, we want to to uplift them and do them. So um, as you can, uh, Josefina, that would be great and we will support you. And with that, we will hear from Jackie. Thank you so much, yes. So again, it's been an honor to be here with you all. I, um, I, will, I will kind of wrap up with the very things that were supposed to be at the beginning of my other remarks, but I went too, too long already on those. So, um, so yeah, I just want to wrap with some of the great folks who are leading on the change that we need to to, to be in the world. And so I and I'll uh, I'll say that some of these folks are referenced in the "Hold Our Earrings" articles that I, that I put out. So that would be a great link if someone was able to find that. Um, but so in that article, I talk about the the folks who are leading on this from Jessica Tovar who's with Local Clean Energy Alliance, leading on energy justice and energy democratization. From Candy Mossett um, with the Black Mesa, well, no, actually she's with the Indigenous Environmental Network, leading on water is life and water justice, as well as the, the folks from the We the People of Detroit, like Monica Lewis Patrick. Um, Dara Cooper, who's with the National Black Food and Land Justice Alliance and leading on local food efforts as well as land justice issues. Um, folks who are leading on immigration rights included Lydia from um, the Holding Institute in, in Laredo, Texas. Uhuru Hilton and Colette Pichon Battle leading on work with the Movement for Black Lives with the Red, Black and Green New Deal and the Alternatives Pod. It's really starting um, local work around solidarity economies. Cindy Weissner, who I think was on the agenda as well, leading on global connections and recognizing that we're all one part of a, of a global community and need to be linking global to global. Bernice and Shana at the Center for Story-Based Strategy are leading on this critical narrative shift that we need to, because narrative off, is often prologue to, to reality and we need to make sure that we are leading on the narrative. Cara Page has been awesome on leading on healing justice, recognizing that yes, as we move forward and as we build, but there is so much in the way of, um, of, of, of trauma in our lives that we need to be to, to heal from. 
the new trio um, triad and and at the at the helm of the Climate Justice Alliance, Monica Atkins, Benishi Albert, and Marion G are anchoring movement building across translocal organizing. And I'll just wrap with Mimi Ho and Reverend Jackie Lewis, who are leading on this notion of, of, of revolutionary love that needs to anchor our movements and our work and our communities. So I will uh, hand it back to you, Asprey. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for those comments. We did put Hold My Earrings awesome article into the chat for folks to read that. And thanks for lifting up all those beautiful leaders and the work that they're doing. Um, and just to mention that in addition to the call to action to governments and financial institutions that I mentioned earlier, we also um, created a frameworks and initiatives uh, collection that we sent to governments and financial institutions that includes uh, some of these um, frameworks that you have also all called out. And Catherine, maybe you could put the link there so people could see you know, what it is that we, we suggested governments and financial institutions look at for recommendations from the climate justice community, EJ community, from indigenous people. So um, it'd be great to share that. And we're just going to keep, you know, there's um, a saying when you go, if you're uh, in a raft and you're heading in white water rapids and it's really chaotic and all this water is crashing around you and it's a very intense moment and there's rocks that you can crash into and you can die and your boat can capsize. The most important thing is, of course, staying centered with Mother Earth, but look to where you want to end up. Find your through line and keep very focused of where you want to go and not get distracted with the boulder that you could smash into and everything crashing around you. Keep your eye on your through line. And so that's partly why we're having this assembly, because we are very focused on what we want and we need to keep putting forward that agenda and not getting distracted or pulled off target by what it is that um, the, the, the false solutions and many of the things that you had uh, outlined. So thank you for that. And now we will go to uh, Bumika. Maybe Bumika, you could leave your video off so we could hear your voice clearly if you're still with us. Thank you. Hi, yes, I'm still with you and um, I would just like to first of all say very much that um, all the speakers here have been absolute visionaries. I have learned so much. The voices are, that your voices are authentic. Your voices are brilliant. Your messages are the messages of today's decolonial turn. The last year and a half has been a, a real critical changing point. Um, and there is a consciousness shift that is happening globally and we can all feel it. And it is incredibly important to tap into. I think in closing, the one and only thing I'd really like to raise attention to is that there are there, there was a, a UN General Assembly resolution that is not well known um, from 2006. And it actually uh, spells out five basic principles of reparations that all of our movements could uplift and use. Um, the five principles being guarantees of non-repetition. That means structural change that past, that, that ongoing systems of injustice will not be repeated. Restitution of communities that have been wronged. Compensation, rehabilitation, and satisfaction of, 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 of the guarantee of non-repetition. This uh, reparations principles has been mobilized by reparations movements globally, and particularly the Stop Mangamizi movement that is coming out of the Caribbean African diaspora. And so I just wanted to quote uh, Chinwezu, who back in 1993 at the uh, first Pan-African Conference on Reparations, he said, reparations is not just about money. It is not even mostly about money. In fact, it is not even 1% of what reparations is about. Reparations is about making repairs, mental repairs, psychological repairs, cultural, organizational, and social repairs, institutional and technological repairs, economic, political, and educational repairs, repairs of every type that we need in order to recreate just societies. And so with that, 
um, ethos of repair. I, I, I personally, with um, almost two decades now of trying to advocate to governments and international financial institutions, I come with the with the, with the, with the position and the and the vision that it really has to be movements holding political leaders accountable and that advocacy without that accountability from the streets is just falling on deaf ears over and over again. It has to be movement led. Those of us in the UN General Assembly rooms, those of us making these speeches, it has to be supported and connected to the real, um, action and lives, the embodied lives on the streets, in the communities. And that is why what all of you are doing is the absolute, absolute core of the change needed. So with that gratitude to everyone, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your comments and your advocacy and support you as you go forward. And um, uh, with that, I will hand the floor over to Casey. Casey. Thank you. I, for the Ponca Nation right now, what we've been involved in is trying to recognize the rights of nature legally. I think that all of these wise women who have given such beautiful uh, advice and, and brought up their own community experiences are, are the perfect markers for this moment in history that we're in the ability to claim and change. And, and for us here at home, that's one of the things that we're trying to do by creating statutes that recognize the rights of nature that are, are immutable. They've been there uh, from time immemorial. And so by putting them down on a piece of paper like those colonial types like, and by saying we're exerting sovereignty to protect all of nature, which we're a part of, not separate from, and we're not just protecting nature, of course, we're, we are nature protecting itself. And that has to be really recognized. So uh, by doing rights of nature work here and recognizing hopefully the rights of the rivers next, then we protect it from the extractive industry that is exerting itself here and creating a situation of, of environmental genocide. Now, the Ponca people have, have been reduced down to 200 and some before in various forms and of, environment, of genocide. This is a different sort now. We also are working with the Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature to uh, form an indigenous council for the rights of nature. And I invite all of you to participate with us. By, by contacting GARN, the Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature, and participating in how we're going to create this council. Because I believe that we have to empower every portion of the circle, every way that you and I can think of at this moment. So things happen quickly. We're not in a position to wait. We're not in a position to be able to give a lot of time to policy making. We have to have that change happen in an instant uh, in order for us to, to change the things for our future generations. We also need to be very vocal as far as I'm concerned and call out these people who are those uh, extractive industry heads as the mass murderers they are. Instead of going soft and saying, you know, we just want you to change to renewable energy, say no. You're killing life on earth. You are part of a mass murder uh, conspiracy. And yeah, I kind of like to get out in the streets and be rowdy with you guys. I'll look forward to that next. Love you all. Warrior up. Yes, indeed. Call out from Casey Camp Hornet, Warrior Up, and love everything about what you're saying and to all the panelists. And it's, it's true. There's no time to be conservative right now. This is a life and death moment. And uh, just in, in honor of Casey saying that, we're putting into the chat, uh, some of you might have missed a, a video that we shared 
earlier on of um, a group of indigenous leaders, indigenous women, uh, when we went to uh, the shareholder meeting of uh, Credit Suisse and uh, bought all of them shares. And we went into the meeting and we told them right to their faces how they were violating indigenous rights, how they were destroying the planet. And yeah, in front of 2,000 of their shareholders. And I couldn't agree with Casey more. We need to uh, really warrior up here. Be healers, but be warrioresses because there's no time to lose. So thank you, Casey, for that call to action and your strength. Um, I'll never forget being with you in Madrid during a huge action. Uh, I'm sure Arrow was there, uh, Jackie, others. Um, and we were you know, just demanding from governments that they stop this in action and they listen to climate justice and they stop these market mechanisms and there was a huge rally and Casey was right at the front of that and they were trying to debadge us and we got all kicked out of the the cop for a day and fought our way back in and all kinds of things happened but it was important that we were there to say we see you we we, we demand our justice we demand rights for frontline communities and um, um, there's there's definitely a need for that now. This is not a time to be nice and quiet for sure. And with that, um, I want to, uh, I got a request that I'm getting over my, my secret people that are back there in the secret background that, um, that our, our colleague Ariel has something more that she wanted to add and we'll end with Ariel and, and her presentation. I thank you all so much. Um, I love you dearly. I want to say that for the whole world to hear. You all are awesome. Thank you for joining us. And Ariel, uh, take us to, to, to your final comment you wanted. Actually, this is so perfect, a perfect segue because I wanted to inspire everyone because we are leading up to the COP26 in Glasgow, which we're not going to have all those people, but it's the power of Indigenous voice, the power of our women that rises up in these spaces. And I wanted to share a video of the mass mobilization in Madrid from COP25 with such amazing, powerful stories about what climate justice means and how we need to be moving towards decolonization. And with that, I believe the video should be queued up. We are one with the earth, with the sky, with the sea, with the sun, we are one. For indigenous people, Unuhit, the notion that we are one is a simple truth that has guided our life in ways that has sustained us since the beginning of time. We value the sacred knowledge of the earth that has been passed down to us through the generations. Knowledge that can bring us the healing that the world so desperately needs in this time. As we face the most critical challenge of our time, climate change, we urge all peoples to shift their relationships with the earth and with each other. As indigenous youth, we are in the front lines of climate change and we are also in the front lines of fighting it. Indigenous rights are imperative to climate justice because climate change is the result of colonialism. My ancestors were the original climate activists beginning at first contact with our resistance to the desecration of our sacred lands and sacred waters. For, for hundreds of years since colonization, we have been saying that this way, this colonial way of relating to our lands from a point of extraction, from a point of, of taking without reciprocity, without giving back, is flawed and it will drive us to destruction. And now we are on the precipice of global collapse. We as indigenous youth are calling on global leaders to do better. We've sacrificed everything for our lands. We fought, we have died, we have had our children taken away from our homes because of these lands. And we are calling you to, to, to fulfill your responsibilities. Because it's not just about protecting our livelihoods. It's about the livelihoods of your children and your future generations and our ability to, to live on, on, this, on this sacred land. No, y actualmente hay 33 mil personas que están en riesgo de perderlo todo por el levantamiento del nivel del mar. 
Nosotros no consumimos combustibles fósiles y a pesar de ello somos los que más vamos a sufrir. Somos los que más sufrimos por el cambio climático. Estamos a punto de perder nuestra lengua, nuestra tierra, nuestra tradición por la forma en la que viven en las ciudades. Así que tenemos que dejar estas palabras vacías, estas palabras de los gobernantes que no están haciendo nada porque necesitamos acción ya. Necesitamos acción ya por las mujeres, por los niños, por la comunidad LGBT, por todos, por los pueblos indígenas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. And um, so much uh, power to uh, Black, Brown, Indigenous uh, women and gender diverse leaders. Thank you for guiding us, for taking us to where we need to go. Um, all power and blessings to all of you. Thank you for joining us today in this really important discussion. And we'll see you all soon. We will see you all soon. Thank you. So over the past six days, we have been hearing from an incredible group of leaders who are addressing the root causes, struggles, and policies that are at the heart of the climate crisis. Over 100 presenters from 40 countries have demonstrated why Black, Brown, Indigenous, and grassroots women and gender device leaders are key to just and effective climate solutions as they have shared their visions and strategies and struggles for shaping a healthy and equitable world. We can, and I personally have been truly honored to have hosted a gathering of such remarkable leaders and to be with all of you who have joined us from around the world who are also doing such incredible work in your communities. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I wanted to thank our powerful International Steering Committee the 150 partner organizations, some who have been live streaming with us over social media platforms. I want to thank the remarkable interpreters on their marathon six days with us, and also particularly our phenomenal organizing team of Catherine Quaid, Ashley Bordado, Livia Charles, Marquia Thomas, and Carmen Caprillas. And in particular, I would like for uh, Catherine Quaid and Ashley Guardardo, who have been all of the keepers of these things behind the scenes and all the logistics and all the technology and gazillions of emails and so much organizing. If you two would please um, undo your videos so that we could see you and give you an applause. If you're both there, please join us. I don't see you. Maybe I need to be in gallery view. Yeah, we're in gallery view. All Hello, right. everyone. Hey. I know Ashley's still working behind the scenes, uh, but just wanted to say hi. All right. Well, thank you, Ashley, and to Catherine, who we honor so deeply for your work. Thank you so much. And we're really determined that all the work here and calls to action have been heard by governments and financial institutions during the UN General Assembly and now going forward to COP26 and beyond because our agenda is for life. It's, it's way beyond these, these moments of, of the United Nations. There, there are calls to the web of life, to Mother Earth. Um, worldwide, women and gender diverse leaders are standing up to fight for the rights of our communities and nature. Let's be clear. We can't argue, negotiate, or buy our way out of the climate crisis. It's time for us to respect the natural laws, to respect the rights of Mother Earth, and together we're sending a powerful message to governments and institutions that enough is enough. It's time to immediately leave fossil fuels in the ground, to transition to a just, decentralized, democratized, and sustainable energy future. Our voices are shining boldly with dignity, wisdom, love and strength in the midst of horrifying and unlawful violence by state and corporate actors, including attacks and the criminalization of women land defenders for peaceful actions to simply protect water, forests and climate and our children's future. We're rising to say colonization must end. 
sacrifice zones and environmental racism must end. Violence against women's body, bodies by extractive industries, this must end. The desecration of indigenous sacred sites and violations against indigenous land rights must end. The destruction of earth and water must end. So let it be said loud and clear that we're not gonna stop speaking out and demonstrating until we keep fossil fuels in the ground, stop deforestation and ocean pollution, implement gender equality, racial justice, respect indigenous rights and the rights of nature, and immediately finance address transition to 100% renewable regenerative energy for all, and that we still stay well below 1.5 degree rise in global temperature. This is our red line to protect and defend Mother Earth, all species, and the very web of life. And, and I want us to remember that our ancestors are with us. We've been reminded of this throughout the days. Our ancestors are with us and our many relatives, those that are older and wiser than us, the ancient waterways, the deserts, our forests, our oceans, our mountains, all of our magnificent planet, all of creation. So it's good to remember that we are fighting for, what is it we're fighting for? And who are our allies? Our goal is to keep building a global women's climate justice action movement. We will continue on with our fierce love and tenderness for each other and all generations and our precious mother earth. So thank you all so much for organizing in this assembly and this collective work going onward forward. We will never stop. And with that, I'm really honored to invite two strong women leaders to close our event with their powerful words and their songs. I wanted to end with their artistry um, as we celebrate this moment after six days together and as we continue hand in hand going forward. And with that, I hand the floor over to Naria Alicia Garcia, who is Chicana from Mexico. She's a UN Young Champion of the Earth 2020 and coordinator for Run for Salmon Prayer, amongst other roles, and Desiree Harp, who is Mishwa and Wapaho, excuse me, Wish Iwa Wapo, also a coordinator for Run for Salmon Prayer. She has done incredible organizing as well in different roles and is an incredible music artist. And with that, I hand the floor over to you two to, to carry us into your beautiful song and prayer for life. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Osprey, Tlaso Kamati, so much for you for your energy for the energy of all of my sisters aunties grandmas on this call uh thank you for your wisdom thank you everybody who joined the past week and um i hope that uh what you heard here and what you are taking with you can help sustain your spirit and your heart in the work you do for your people, your communities, and for yourself. We can't forget that we are part of Mother Earth. And so fighting for Mother Earth includes uh, taking care of ourselves. Um, I was so moved to tears to see that video um, that Erin shared earlier from our time in, at the COP in Madrid to just be reminded of our collective power and how much we are so meant to be here in this time. Um, and so it is my honor to just uh, help close us out um, our time this past week with a beautiful song uh, like Osprey shared. I've had the honor of serving um, this Run for Salmon prayer journey. That's a 300 mile prayer journey that we do in the largest watershed in California for the return of salmon for the revitalization of indigenous life ways and for the protection of water. And it was in one of the creeks um, where this beautiful song came uh, to my sister Desiree Harp, Jesse Naomi and Cole Oak. Um, and it's a song that we sing in ceremony. Um, we follow uh, the water for two weeks on 300 miles, just putting prayers down being in protocol with um, all of our tribes um, as we cross the territories and just staying connected to spirit to really understand how it is that we need to be in service in this crucial moment on Mother Earth's history. So 
Um, I'm gonna, because of Zoom, uh, we can't sing together. So I'm gonna go on mute and let my sister's beautiful energy and vibration just nourish us and just invite everybody who's on this call to, you know, turn off your camera and just close your eyes and whew, take a deep breath. Uh, to integrate all the medicine that we shared here these past couple of days. <sighs> and just call on your waters, call on your ancestral waters, the waters that feed you, the waters that flow through your taps, um, to just connect to this song and just receive this, um, this beautiful medicine. And um, while my sister sings, I'm just gonna uh, type in chat the lyrics. Um, and this is, I hope this is a song that can carry you for the rest of this year. Uh, I hope this is a song that can support your heart, uplift your spirit, and just uh, remind you of how valuable you are in this time. And I'll pass it over to my sister, Desiree Harp. Hello, I come from the Onatsatis Nation. Um, the colonized name of my tribe is um, Wapo. And so she introduced me as Mishwal Wapo. And this is a song that came to us by the water. Water so deep, water so wide, water braiding the earth and the sky. Mountain so strong, mountain so tall, lifted by spirit and holding a song. Let the mountains guide us. And the waters carry our songs back to creation where we belong when we free our voices, we free our hearts, breaking chains inside. Tearing us apart. Water so deep, water so wide, water braiding the earth and the sky. Mountain so strong, mountain so tall, lifted by spirit and holding us all. Seren are returning. Ancient paths in the stars, the light of life inside us is lit by the same spark. When we lose our way, think there's nowhere left to turn. Prayers are all around. We can always return. Water so deep, water so wide, water braiding the earth and the sky. Mountain so strong, mountain so tall, lifted by spirit and holding the song. Hi, Kyle, thank you. Thank you, Desi. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna be dropping the lyrics in the chat so you can just uh, take this prayer um, with you wherever it is that you will go once you hit your leave button from the Zoom call. Thank you both so much. Uh, Desiree, I heard that song um, just by chance um, on YouTube. And I just want to thank you because it brings tears to my eyes. It's such a beautiful song and you sing so beautifully. It, it really moves me. And I, I deeply appreciate you taking the time to share music and song and spirit with us because that's what carries us through 
the ebb and flow of this work. So um, it means a lot. Um, there's a lot of different ways of presenting ourselves and you do this so beautifully. And I want to thank you um, very, very much for, for sharing that with us. It means a lot and it will carry us for the many days ahead. And thank you very much, Nuria, again, always for your beautiful um, words and helping us to stay grounded and I wish you both well in your work for Run for Salmon and the many other pieces of advocacy you're doing and your artistry. So thank you um, for, for that closing. It really means a lot. And with that, we are going to uh, close our six day assembly. Uh, we will continue to be in touch with all of you. Please stay in touch with us. We send you our love. And as I said um, this morning, we are here for you. We need to be together. It is not a time to be alone. And as we go through more turbulence, we will need each other even more. And we stand strong, we stand in solidarity, and we stand for our sacred mother earth and all generations. And with that, much love to you all. Thank you. Thank you.